This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. surveillance, Tom and Francine from London and New York. Now still with us, our conversation on the U.S. economy with Ellen Zentner, a Morgan Stanley chief U.S. economist. Ellen, thank you so much for sticking around. We were talking a bit about the Fed and the stimulus. Overall, when should we start worrying about in inflation? So I think we don't have to worry about inflation for, for quite some time. And our forecasts are uh, for, for core PCE this year and next year are well above consensus, well above where the Fed is. Uh, some of that is that we have a faster recovery next year built in post-vaccine with a lot of stimulus um, behind it as being normalized. Uh, but we don't have to worry about it. In fact, we should embrace it uh, because it's not going to beg a monetary policy response. And that's always where the, the issue with inflation came in was what does it say in terms of the Fed's reaction function? Well, the Fed's going to strengthen its reaction function to let us know that even just getting to 2% is not good enough. Uh, and so, you know, we've got higher inflation, but I don't think we need to worry about it. But, I mean, you know, will we actually have some kind of forward guidance today? I know we heard from Fed Governor Leo Brainard recently calling what we're living through a thick fog of uncertainty. So does forward guidance help in these kind of cases? Well, it can, but they've already put in, so they put in, in terms of how long to expect rates to remain low, um, in terms of their balance sheet policies, they've given us the forward guidance that rates are gonna remain low for quite some time, uh, and that uh, they're gonna do 80 billion in purchases in treasuries. That's a floor at a minimum, uh, open-ended for as far as the eye can see. And, and that can certainly ramp up, and that's something that Chair Powell has reminded us of. Uh, and so that's the forward guidance that's in place. Strengthening that forward guidance is something that they're still working towards, and they, they won't be rolling out something new at this meeting, but they will f be furthering those discussions. And that's, that's really what we think will dominate or has dominated their conversation yesterday, will dominate their conversation today, is continuing to move towards consensus on how to change their framework in order to issue a statement to provide these more firm forward guidance. They're, they're not there yet, um, but I think it's going to come up in the Q&A and we'll get more hints from Chair Powell and how those discussions have been going. Yeah, well, and I want you to play securities analysis an analyst here. I've got GE aviation orders down 56 percent. Healthcare is better, only down 18 percent. GE power down 42 percent. GE Renewable Energy down 19%. These are unit dynamics that you and I have never seen. What does that mean for corporate confidence to CapEx, which creates jobs? Well, I think, um, so everything about this, Tom, is something that we've never seen. I think what we're, what we're seeing now is that the, the, the strength in the economy that we're seeing in the data data improving sequentially is coming in the areas of the economy that were the hardest yeah, hit. I, I don't, um, Ellen, Ellen, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but this is absolutely critical what you just said. Are we looking at the first derivative dynamics or are we looking to getting back to a new level that is below the level we knew Valentine's Day this year? So the level is going to be lower. It, it's getting back to what, what we've called um, the, the, uh, a new uh, a new normal in that uh, even after we've prepared, even after we've recovered, you know, you're going to have a hit to potential uh, growth. Uh, you're going to have uh, uh, a hit to labor force participation. We, we can very easily come to the conclusion that there's going to be some amount of permanent job loss. This is what terrifies the Fed is we don't have a view on that. We don't know how much job loss will be permanent, and especially while the fiscal support continues. Long, uh, you know, hopefully long from now, when the fiscal support has faded and the economy can stand on its own, we'll start to be able to gauge what some of the, the, the more permanent uh, damage, lasting damage could be. Now there's gonna be other areas of the economy that will accelerate it. Um, and so on net, that's not a bad place to be in, when we've had such a massive shocking uh, hit to the economy. Um, but that's what we have to bear in mind. A lot of the things that are improving now are those that are improving off a very low base. 
we still have yet to find what our new footing is, and we're just going to have to be patient on that. Thank you so much for joining us. Ellen Zentner there, Morgan Stanley, Chief U.S. Economist. Now, also be sure to tune in to Bloomberg TV's one-hour special on Hong Kong. It's Hong Kong on Edge 2. That's 7 p.m. on Friday in New York. That's uh, a little bit later, of course, a London time. And then it will air throughout the weekend. Also, don't miss our Fed special. That's also at uh, 7 p.m. tonight. So the focus, of course, will be on any kind of extra forward guidance. We were just having a great conversation there with Ellen Zettner. The markets are focusing on a couple of things. So they're focusing on the number of infections whilst hoping to have more news from the Fed, which is why the dollar's dipping. Stocks are actually fluctuating before the Federal Reserve's policy meeting. And then European banking stocks are falling after some worse than expected estimates. This is Bloomberg. data flowing seamlessly. We keep on so you can keep on. The Boston Symphony Orchestra presents BSO at Home, a collection of concerts, at-home lessons, and behind-the-scenes stories to enjoy while you stay at home. Learn more at bso.org slash at home. Well, it's a really a reminder, isn't it, just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade. We did see some pressure on the yuan. We did see some pressure on the futures. That is now being reversed. Bloomberg Surveillance Futures Lift here. NASDAQ Futures Lift nicely as we get out front of tech executives here in a bit. Day. Futures up 7, Dow Futures up 20. Uh, dollar weaker, I guess I would point that out. I'm watching Turkish Lira as an oddity in EM. Right now on the oddity of the collapse of industrial America, we just saw General Electric out with uh, <clears throat> challenging earnings. Brooke Sutherland joins, writing always on the strength of industrial America. Brooke, 3M the other day, GM this morning, massive unit decline in their operating businesses. Can they cut costs fast enough to keep up with the unit collapse? I mean, they're certainly trying. I would say GE more so than, um, you know, a lot of other companies. Obviously, Larry Culp 
um, is undertaking a big transformation of this company and the coronavirus is sort of throwing a wrench in those plans, although also arguably accelerating them. Um, I mean, if you look at the cost cutting that they're doing in aviation, that's obviously one of GE's stronger segments and was not necessarily an area they were looking for cost cuts in the past. So when I talked to Larry after uh, the first quarter earnings, he said, you know what, this actually is sort of an opportunity to bring some of that forward. Now, obviously, I don't know if anybody would have expected or wanted the kind of hit that they're taking in their aviation department, but yeah. they are aggressively trying to cut costs. So yeah. this is pretty ugly. Well, power wasn't that good as well. But I mean, Minnesota manufacturing and mining, and I understand these are change companies from the romance of the 20th century. Is there an attitude that you see in your reporting that they've got to really cut costs by substantial 10, 12, 15 percent amounts, or is this like a variable event where they get back to normality next year? Honestly, I think it depends on what you're talking about. I mean, if you're in aviation, we're seeing really aggressive cost cuts, even from companies that were not cutting back in April and May. So Honeywell, Raytheon, they came out with really heavy cost cuts that are somewhat in line with what you've seen from GE and Boeing so far. But now, you know, when you look at sort of the other end of the spectrum, 3M actually struck a note of optimism when they were talking about overall sales in July actually being up by a low single digit percentage so far uh, this month. And they said that is a broad based recovery. Rockwell Automation talking about rolling back the temporary pay reduction that they had to take for their employee base. They expect to do that by the end of December. CSX, Union Pacific, bringing employees off of furlough. So I think it depends on what part of the manufacturing uh, economy you are in, but obviously aviation is a really tough place to be right now, and there is just no light at the end of the tunnel there. Um, Brooke, G is also saying it's launching an effort to fully monetize its Baker Hughes position over the next three years. What exactly does that mean? They've been in the process of trying to wind down the stake, and so they've done, you know, two pretty big um, sales. Now, obviously, those have not been at, uh, you know, the, the most ideal prices, and I would say continuing to wind that down probably means that they've sort of accepted the reality of where that Baker Hughes stake is trading, and they just want to be done with it. They want to get out of it. They want to monetize it and bring in some cash here, but... Um, you know, it is going to be tricky to time that market uh, and really sort of get to the price that maybe they were expecting. I think those expectations are going to have to come down just with the trading that we've seen in Baker Hughes and the other uh, oil equipment providers, given the severe drop off in demand from the coronavirus. Brooke, thanks so much. Terrific briefing there. Brooke Sutherland, Bloomberg Opinion Columnist. Now, um, coming up later, Lawrence Culp, Larry Culp, the GE Chairman and Chief Executive Officer. Don't miss that conversation. That's at 12 p.m. in New York. That's 5 p.m. in London. Now, let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news in New York City. Here's Ritika Gupta. Hi, Ritika. Hi, Francine Tom. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has drawn a line in the sand on a new stimulus package. He's insisting that his proposed changes to liability law be included wholesale in the legislation. That's bogged down talks between President Trump's representatives and Democrats. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says it shows McConnell's not serious about reaching a deal. And mixed news on the coronavirus pandemic front in the U.S. Florida reported a record number of deaths, but new infections slowed down in two states grappling with outbreaks, California and Arizona, and the positive test rate in Texas fell to the lowest in a month. The Trump administration and the Oregon's governor's office reportedly are in talks about pulling federal agents out of Portland. According to the Associated Press, the state would have to beef up law enforcement in return. Earlier this week, there was talk of sending more federal agents to Portland because of protests and vandalism. And Joe Biden says he'll pick his vice presidential nominee next week. And he told reporters he'll let them know as soon as he does. The Democratic presidential nominee has pledged to pick a woman running mate. Last week, Biden said the group of candidates includes four black women, amongst others. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Tom Francine. Larry Ritika, thanks so much. It's extraordinary how non-fed this Fed Day is, and yet it is very important. We just heard that from Ellen Zentner driving our conversation this afternoon. We are thrilled to bring you Al Broadus, of course, legendary at the Richmond Fed. Al brought us on this burgeoning deficit, unimaginable. 
unimaginable World War II-like deficit that we have and what that means for the fabric of our Federal Reserve System. Look for that today. This is Bloomberg. knocks at the door don't say blimey I've still got my pajamas on to say yes to stuff and it will take you into some places we're clearly going through some very unusual uh, times uh, and you know e enormous uh, difficulties uh, getting groups of people to agree on things from Bloomberg's European headquarters in the city of London join us on leaders with LACWA New order placed for euro at 117.52. I'm placing a new order to sell short at 117.52. That's what adding commodities exposure to your stock and bond portfolio can help provide. The Bloomberg Commodity Index is the standard for commodity market exposure. 23 traded commodities are represented. Agriculture, livestock, metals, and energy. The Bloomberg Commodity Index is the benchmark most widely used by investment professionals globally. Track your commodity investments with a proven financial information partner. The Bloomberg Commodity Index. True diversification. Surveillance. Good morning, everyone. A lift of the future is up seven. Francine Lacroix in London. I'm Tom Keen in New York. He is the Richmond Fed. There was a gentleman named Mr. Black, and then there was Al Broadus, and then on to Jeffrey Lacker. But the character and true fabric of the Richmond Fed is always and will be Al Broadus. We're thrilled he could join us today. Al, you've never seen a deficit like this. How does the deficit growth, the deficit sustainability, the deficit reality that we have have, how does it change the dialogue at the Eccles building? Well, you know, I think uh, none of us are comfortable with these deficits, that's that's for sure. But I, I think it's well recognized that uh, this is just a really unusual situation, and I don't need to, maybe we people talk about this uh, endlessly uh, on your program and elsewhere. Uh, and you got you got to deal with it with policy in a really wholesale way, and they've done that. And I think I think so far the progress uh, has been has been good. Uh, so I, I think the general thinking around that table probably is we don't we're not comfortable with these deficits, uh, but we're going to have to live with them for a while, and hopefully uh, you know we'll we'll deal with uh, bringing them down when the economic situation. And the driver, which is the right. pandemic, uh, gets uh, gets to a point where we we have the opportunity to do that. But for the, now, I think it's just steady as she goes. The academics of the Richmond Fed has been so varied and interesting. But if you color and combine together Richmond, Atlanta, maybe Bob McTeer in the Georgia School, the Dallas Fed as well, there's a huge body of the American public that's grievously concerned about deficit buildup. Can you support trillions of dollars of additional stimulus to overlay over what Chairman Powell is doing? I think we have. I think at this point, uh, Tom, we really don't have a lot of choice. Uh, and I think many of the most recent statements by uh, Reserve Bank presidents now on the committee uh, have been calling for uh, continued fiscal uh, stimulus. Uh, I think uh, uh, there's going to be some concern at the Fed 
about the difficulty of getting uh, this current uh, uh, d division between the House and the Senate uh, corrected and, 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 and done. Uh, but uh, that's going to add to the deficit. And I just have to go back to what I said a minute ago. Uh, we're not used to it. We don't like it. Uh, but we've got to live with it uh, until we get a good solid floor under the economy. Hopefully the path of the pandemic will make it possible to do this with less future further buildup uh, as we move through the second half of the year and into 2021. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, if, if things do go south, with it, we have to be prepared for that. And I think what's happening now is we're trying to prevent that from getting any worse. And that's really job one. Uh, and bringing the deficit, look, I don't like deficits. I think you know that. I don't like the, infl the potential inflation or longer term inflationary implications uh, of high deficits and the, the fact that the Fed is essentially monetizing uh, a, a lot of this. But, for, you know, you've got to prioritize. We've got to get the weakness in the economy uh, un undergirded so that uh, we can look forward to the day when. Uh, we get we'll, we'll we'll see more growth in the economy and that deficits will just naturally begin to go down. Mr. Broaddus, when will we see a, a much stronger U.S. economy? What kind uh, of good question. Will we see uh, that? A lot is going to depend. Uh, uh, there's several possibilities. It's hard to hard to know for sure. Uh, it, and again, I think it comes back to the path of the pandemic and and uh, how we deal with that. I think maybe it was uh, Robert Kaplan, the Dallas Fed president, uh, I'm not sure of this, but uh, one of the uh, current Reserve Bank presidents said that the really, uh, maybe it was uh, Eric, uh, and, and that the best economic tool now is the things we're trying to do to get the pandemic under control to bend the curve down. Uh, so hopefully we'll have some success. We have. Had I have to remove position. It's moved too fast, too far. So position, uh, not position, order to sell short, euro, remove. Maybe a little bit of progress in the southern states towards uh, easing the caseload increase. If that were to turn into something like a trend, that would make a huge difference and, and make yeah. our job a lot easier and make the day when we begin to grow again come sooner rather than later. You, you mentioned that you're worried about inflation. You're worried about these deficits. When do investors start worrying about that? Well, you know, I think some investors are already worrying about it. And I think some of the run-up in, in the price of gold probably reflects uh, concern on the part of some, <coughs> of, of some investors. I don't want to suggest here that I think inflation is a clear and present current danger. I don't expect to see... Uh, actually, what we uh, would like to see is an increase. Uh, what the Fed would really like to see uh, is an increase in the underlying trend uh, rate of inflation. Uh, back up close to the 2% target. I think that would make conducting monetary policy uh, a, a lot easier. But, and, you know, if that uh, we begin to see a movement in that direction at some point, probably more than a year further down the road, then, then you could begin to see some upside risk on the inflation uh, front. But that's for the future. I uh, have to look forward to it, have to be aware of it. Uh, but that's uh, something that the Fed will have to deal with in the future. Right now, the, I think the key thing is to get the inflation rate uh, up uh, yeah. uh, and bring it closer to the 2% target. Uh, the Fed, uh, uh, I'll give you a long answer here, but the Fed uh, uh, at this meeting is going to be discussing I think the kind of strategy it wants to follow uh, to ensure that something like that uh, happens. We have an inflation target of 2%, but I think there's going to be discussion about the possibility of going to something, call it average inflation targeting, which would allow the inflation rate for a period of time yeah. to move above 2% uh, in order to get us uh, uh, onto a better inflation track.
Al Broadus, thank you so much for joining us today. He is the former Richmond Fed president. Now, stay with Bloomberg for our special coverage of the Fed. The Fed decides. That's at 2 p.m. in New York. That's 7 p.m. in London. Now, Barclay traders, Barclays traders had a blockbuster second quarter offsetting the British retail bank turmoil caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Now, the bank security division reported a 60% gain in foreign exchange rates and credit trading revenue. The lender also took a £1.6 billion pound charge to anticipate bad loans from the crisis that's slightly higher than expected bringing the total to 3.7 billion so far well here's what the chief executive Jess Daly had to say clearly there's been an extraordinary economic contraction globally but particularly in in uh, in the US and uh, and, and in the UK, our two principal markets. Um, uh, we've taken a, a sizable impairment reserve, uh, 3.6 billion pounds for the first half, including the 1.6 billion pounds in the second quarter. The vast majority of that are, uh, are derived by our risk models, where we put uh, economic forecasts into those models, future unemployment rates, future GDP rates, uh, spend growth, et cetera. And, uh, and those models produce those impairment numbers. And we think we have been conservative um, uh, uh, to build proper impairment reserves. Let's see how the economies, particularly in the UK and the US, unfold in the next couple of quarters. But uh, we like the comfort of having you know, strong impairment numbers, and, but yet at the same time maintaining profitability for the bank. Jess, good morning. I'm looking at your investment banking business. Uh, absolute massive beats really across the board. Fixed income up 60%. The estimate was 30%. Equities trading up 30%. Estimate was 3%. The question is, could Barclays keep this up? You know, we've had, um, uh, I think, very good performance in our markets business over the last couple of years, and clearly in the last couple of quarters. Uh, I think, like all the banks uh, that have reported thus far have commented on, uh, the volatility in the first two quarters were quite exceptional this year. And I think people are expecting uh, a degree of normalization. But as you mentioned, you know, with our fixed income credit and currency trading uh, up, up 60 percent for the second quarter, than up 80% for the first half year overall. I think we're gaining market share. Um, we want to stay, stay open and available for our, our, uh, our buy side clients, the insurance companies, pension funds, et cetera, that underscore the capital markets. But I'd also say that I think what we're seeing is in part the, uh, the result of, of a lot of regulatory changes over the last decade. If you go back to the crisis of 2008, 2009, it was really based on bank balance sheets getting into trouble. What I think governments have properly done is they've really moved the focus of financing economic growth from banks to the capital markets, to companies issuing debt and equity, and to firms like pension funds and mutual funds buying those securities. That's really the story, I think, of the first and second quarter is the resurgence of the capital markets led by massive amounts of liquidity provided by central banks. And I think that has proved to be a fairly constructive response to the pandemic and the consequential economic crisis. I wanted to ask you about the dividend. I know the report says you'll have discussions about it towards the end of the year, but are you talking to the regulator about bringing the dividend back? You know, I, I think what we you know, have all settled on, and, and, and I think the decision around the dividend earlier on in this year, given the enormous economic uncertainty we all faced, is understandable. Uh, we don't know what the second half is ultimately going to mean for the economies and for the bank itself. Uh, I think the current program to uh, move out to the fourth quarter of 2020 uh, discussions about dividend payments uh, in 2021 is prudent. Uh, and so we'll have those discussions with our board, uh, first and foremost, but then also with our, uh, with our regulators. So I think we're going to leave it to, uh, to towards the end of the year to, uh, to try to make a determination as to reinstating our dividends next year or not. Well, that was Jess Daly, the chief executive of Barclays, speaking to us a bit earlier. Up next, Lauren Sauer, Johns Hopkins assistant professor of emergency medicine. That's coming up shortly, and this is Bloomberg.
is Bloomberg Best, your weekly review of the most important business news analysis and interviews from Bloomberg Television around the world. Ken Burns, welcome to Bloomberg Big Decisions. We have always been a mixture of things. We are always stronger for that mixture. Growth is a way to stay competitive, delight more and more consumers. Welcome to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. They've moved the needle by acknowledging that they have to monitor the content. What is one word of advice you'll take with you? Learn how to listen. And that is certainly something that has served me well. Ankiti, where do you go from here? It's a huge market. It's a huge opportunity. I want to go 100x from here. Our philosophy is to partner where we can and stand apart when we should. service is peace of mind. Juzi from customer support is responding to a 500% increase in daily call volume, no matter what. We keep on so you can keep on. does, as you say, have some catching up to do on that front. So we are expecting to see a little bit of strength coming through at the start of trade. How long will it last, though? Yeah, the perennial question... This is Bloomberg Surveillance, Tom and Francine from London and New York. Now, as we continue to track the virus, Bloomberg has developed a unique partnership with the leading authority on COVID-19. Johns Hopkins has been at the forefront of the international response. And every day, we bring you insight from experts in public health, infectious disease, and emergency preparedness. Well, joining us today is Lauren Sauer, Johns Hopkins University Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine. Lauren, always great to speak to you. Thank you so much for making the time. When you look at uh, Moderna and some of the uh, trials and actually efforts to find a vaccine. Are we any closer to finding one now than we were a month ago? We are moving closer, um, and the Moderna data that's coming out both in the animal trials and the human trials are looking good. Um, you know, keeping in mind that both the Moderna and the Pfizer um, that just started their phase three trials are mRNA uh, vaccines, so these are these are brand new technologies. We haven't had one um, that has gone through all three phases before. So, um, you know, there's this cautious optimism. But um, Moderna is new to bringing vaccines to market and has received a bunch of money from Operation Warp Speed to push this forward very, very quickly. So um, I think everyone is anxiously awaiting the phase three data from these 30,000 person trials. Uh, Lauren, overall, is there just too much hope in a vaccine? Are we, you know, eluding ourselves that we could have it as quickly as some commentators think we could? Um, I, I think that there are numbers being thrown out there that are a lot quicker than than what people who make vaccines for a living um, think are realistic. That being said, all, all you know, all the resources are going towards this effort. Um, I, the key is to make sure that the rest of the supply chain that supports the science um, is there and ready to go. So ensuring that we have manufacturing capabilities, ensuring that we have um, plants with uh, good manufacturing processes and safe um, safe capacity to actually create the vaccine are ready to go, ready to roll, that we have those glass vials, that we have the infrastructure in place to actually distribute the vaccine broadly across the globe. Um, all of those are critical elements, and any single one of them could slow down the process. Lauren, will you know, states in the U.S. be ready to reopen schools in September? Um, I think it's it's going to be a state by state situation and maybe even a county by county situation. We have to be really careful about opening reopening schools because we don't fully understand the role kids play um, in the way the vac in the way the virus spreads throughout a, a community. Um, we also have to protect our teachers and families of students who may have. Uh, comorbid conditions who may be vulnerable populations um, and may be more directly impacted. The guidance that came out um, from the White House and from the CDC recently does, certainly does push to reopen schools and gives us a lot of tools that will help that. Um, that being said, there are many hotspots across the country that just do not look ready. And one of the key lines hidden at the bottom of that reopening document is that this will only work if community transmission is slowed um, and there's not yeah. ongoing community transmission. 
Lauren, thank you so much for all the time. Lauren Zauer there of Johns Hopkins. And be sure to check out VRUS Go on the Bloomberg for the latest information. And of course, tune in every day for our exclusive conversation with Johns Hopkins experts for an inside look at battling COVID-19. Now coming up tomorrow, Bloomberg's David Weston will be speaking with Anthony Fauci, the, of course, the director, Dr. Anthony Fauci, a conversation you don't want to miss. Boston Symphony Orchestra presents BSO at Home. While you stay inside, enjoy a curated collection of archive concerts and behind-the-scenes stories from BSO musicians. BSO Homeschool provides lessons for music lovers of all ages. New performances and messages from musicians are added regularly. Enjoy these selections and much more at bso.org slash at home. Other tools such as income tax uh, would require a lot of time to prepare because if you don't have the base, this will take time. So whatever we are thinking about, we think also about implementation and ease of implementation. begin to take some chips off the table, you're already seeing it in the futures data, and embrace a little bit more of a cyclical value view. Oh, well, I hope, certainly, uh, that policymakers this time round will recognize that fiscal has to do more of the heavy lifting in terms of supporting the uh, recovery. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. From New York City, for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning, this... It's Bloomberg Surveillance Live on Bloomberg TV and Radio. Alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Abravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Tom Keen, the big three events down in Washington, D.C. The Federal Reserve decides the fiscal talks continue and the tech hearings commence at midday, 12 o'clock Eastern time. There's no question about it, John. What I would think pieces it all together is the American labor economy. Ellen Zender was on in the last hour with Morgan Stanley, and she means no words about it. There's got to be an improvement in the labor economy. And right now, 
wow, that's really iffy. And for the Federal Reserve, Tom, it's the shift from stabilization to accommodation and whether they formalize that in forward guidance. Is it too early? Tom, everyone I've spoken to about this says <clears throat> today is too early yes. to announce forward guidance. Totally agree that it's just too, there's too much noise going on. Central bankers hate noise. Al Broadus was just on the giant of the Richmond Fed over the years, and he made very clear, steady as they go is what we will hear from Chairman Powell. Lisa Rabbits, what an agenda this Wednesday down in Washington. It's all about Washington, and when you talk about the big four tech companies, we're talking about Facebook, Apple, Amazon, as well as Alphabet, all the CEOs testifying in front of an antitrust committee of the House. You've got the Republicans on one side questioning them about stifling conservative voices. On the Democrat side, there's going to be discussion about stifling out competition. Also today, President Trump, not in Washington, where the big agenda is, he's traveling to Texas to talk about restoring energy dominance with less than three days left before the unemployment benefits of $600 a month uh, go out of effect. And then today at 2 p.m. is the FOMC rate decision as well as the 2.30 press conference after that. Looking forward to full coverage on Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg Radio. Let's get to price action this Wednesday morning. Good morning to you all. Equity futures drifting higher, up five points on the S&P 500. In the bond market, that improving risk appetite, sending yields up by a single basis point to 0.59% on a 10-year. And Tom Keane, the blinkers have been on euro dollar for the past month. They're back on today, moving straight on. 117.43, that euro strength, Tom, back on the screen. And the difference now is stronger Japanese yen as well. John, Adam Cole of RBC Capital Markets was stunning yesterday, looking for a 10-big-figure strength in yen from 105 down to 95 out into the distant future. Dolly yen 95. What a call from RBC. Let's get the coverage started right here with Ian Lennon, BMO Capital Markets head of U.S. race strategy. Ian, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. Tom and I were talking about it. Is it too early to announce forward guidance today? Yeah, I'm in agreement that it's a bit early to make the transition to a hard forward guidance in terms of actual numbers that the Fed is looking for before they even start thinking about normalizing monetary policy. Again, this is years away, not quarters away in terms of when they would uh, even contemplate uh, the process of normalization. There's also a sequencing issue. The Fed needs to transition into the new framework before they put hard numbers on their forward guidance. So if the Fed has any ambition of trying to outdove expectations, which has been their attempt uh, throughout much of 2020, I think they're going to be very challenged to do that simply because of the transition to a average year-over-year -year core inflation target, which is anticipated mm. by the end of 2020. Ian, I want you to collar the 10-year yield. Where is support? Where is resistance? Where are the levels that matter for you? At this point, the number one level that I'm looking at in 10-year yields is 53.8 basis points. That was the low that we achieved on the 21st of of April, and that really has defined the lower bound of the range. On the upside, uh, I don't see much compelling until we get to roughly 70 basis points. Wow. What is important? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a wide range, but it's important to keep in mind the background trade has been the flattening of the yield curve. 2020 was supposed to be the year of the, the grand re-steepening because two-year yields are locked into monetary policy expectations. The curve actually flattened as the economic outlook has dimmed, and that's gone against many people in the market and many traders. So if we do have a breakout in the, the range in 10-year yields in the near term, it's more likely to be on the downside than it is the upside. I love it, Tom, how Ian is talking about 53.8. Talk about being precise, and that sort of marks 2020 when that is the level of basis points that we're looking at because yields are so <laughs> low. Ian, one, people are, one thing people are looking for from the FOMC today is possible guidance on buying more treasuries on the long end of the curve, longer dated maturity uh, assets. Do you think that that's on the table today? Uh, it will eventually be on the table. It's something that they're sure to discuss, but I don't think that this is the I don't think this is the meeting that they'll make that transition. Moreover, uh, a, a a twist further out the curve to flatten uh, the shape of the curve even even further. The question becomes how much incremental 
uh, pickup is that going to be for the real economy? How much lower do mortgage rates need to be to stir activity or spur activity in the in the housing market? Uh, the Fed has done a very good job of pushing investors out the risk curve, and we can see that in equities, which continue to outperform, and they do have an incentive to prevent any material retracement in the equity market simply because of the correlation between equity volatility and tightening financial conditions. And they've made it very clear they're keeping financial conditions as easy as possible. So, Ian, help me understand how to push this through the long end of the yield curve. We've got a Federal Reserve that's about to say we'll tolerate higher inflation. Maybe they even move to average inflation targeting, which would basically mean a higher effective inflation target anyway. We've got a fiscal debate that could end up with more supply. And then on top of all of that, there's a conversation about them maybe sitting on the long end of the curve with yield curve control. For anyone in this bond market right now, this is really difficult, isn't it? Yeah, it is very difficult because all of the fundamentals that are occurring suggest that we should have a steeper curve. Not necessarily 10-year yields above 1%, but compared to the front end of the curve, we should see a grind steeper, more compensation to go further up the curve. But the Fed is controlling or is attempting to control either directly through purchases or by job owning the notion that they might be in buying longer dated or more longer dated treasuries later. Well, Ian, on the front end of the curve, the question I think a lot of investors are asking themselves is how far out they should push out that low for longer narrative. If the Federal Reserve does what they did back in December 2012, which was introduce a threshold of unemployment around 6.5%, may well be even lower than that this time around, and say rates stay here until we hit this, how far out do you think we should be pushing where the two-year rate is at the moment? I think it's. I think up to the five-year sector follows intuitively, particularly in light of the prospects for yield curve control at some point in 2021 if the economy doesn't perform as well as the Fed would like to see it. Uh, out to the five-year, even potentially the seven-year sector is not unreasonable, especially given the experience of the last financial crisis. It's going to be years before the Fed moves rates. Ian, I'm looking right now, and certainly the five, two-year yield curve is flattened substantially. I'm wondering, when you talk about how uh, you could see yields drift lower from here, do you see the 30-year yield hitting a new record low by year end based on the fact that the Fed will probably at some point gear their buying toward that long end? A, a, a new fresh record low for 30 years would imply that we're through 70 basis points. I guess that's the level that we saw on the uh, the 9th of March of this year. Uh, I don't think we're going to get there based on Fed buying. To get that low, we would need to see a material ratcheting lower of global growth and inflation expectations that is inconsistent with the macro narrative as it currently stands. Uh, never say never, but that's a pretty significant bogey. I think we're more likely to see fresh lows in the 10-year sector than we are all the way out in the 30 year. Ian, you are acclaimed for granularity in your research note. What you don't know, folks, is it's not just about fixed income and basis points. It's synthesizing everything out there. Ian, do you have a clue on the American labor economy and how it filters into the path of yield? Well, I do think that it's all about the labor market from the Fed's perspective. The Fed Agreed. has been the Fed has been very willing to ignore the potential bubble risks in the equity market or credit products. The Fed has been willing to set aside a lot of criticism with the sole goal of getting the unemployment rate back into more reasonable territory. One of my biggest concerns for the translation of the employment market into the rates space is that the renewed set of lockdowns and paused reopenings are going to create a, a period where there's downside for non-farm payrolls over the course of the next couple months. Yep. And that's going to recast people's expectations for how quickly consumption is going to be able to recover and thereby really limit how far 
10 year yields are able to back up in this environment. Immense uncertainty coming into the next payrolls report. Ian, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. Ian Lennon there of BMO Capital Markets. Tom Keane, next month, absolutely critical, not just for the Federal Reserve, but for the data as well. And I wonder, Tom, how much this Federal Reserve has been conditioned by the experience of the last 10 years in the labor market. The last time they did state contingent forward guidance, the unemployment rate was 6.5%. That was the threshold. I imagine it's going to be a whole lot lower if they do it again. Well, you got like three different measurements of unemployment, as we saw from the lieutenant governor of New York yesterday, quoting 16% in Buffalo. John, what I find absolutely imperative here is not to get to August 7 in the jobs report. We've got to get out 24 hours. Right now, you and I would be spouting about claims coming out. We do that tomorrow. And maybe that'll sharpen the focus down in Washington. Tom, have you seen this quote from Senator Ben Sass? Let me read it to you. The White House is trying to solve bad polling by agreeing to indefensibly bad debt. The proposal is not targeted to fix precise problems. It's about Democrats and Trumpers competing to outspend each other. That's a sense of the division in the Republican Party yeah. in Washington at the moment. I'm just imagining you, John, in Nebraska. In I'm Nebraska. just trying to think of you 100 miles outside Omaha on the way to Cozy. So you've got North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska. Very good. That, do you like and that? Now, what's below I've, Nebraska? I've got, I've got the map. Think nice. Is it Ohio, Sutherland. Just sort of south. East. Kansas, think Dorothy. And then you've got Kansas down. There we are, there. geography with John. <laughs> there we go, at 7-Eleven. We can do this another time, and coming Fargo up on this program. This. Jill Carey Hall from Bank for America Securities will be joining us very shortly. Tech <clears throat> is very much front and center with the big tech CEOs reporting to Capitol Hill later today. From New York City this morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg. With the First Word News, I'm Rishka Gupta. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell insists that businesses, schools and other organizations be protected against coronavirus lawsuits. And that's bogged down talks over a new stimulus package. McConnell is demanding that changes to liability law be included wholesale in the legislation. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says that shows he's not serious about reaching a deal. Federal Reserve policymakers will turn their attention on how to jumpstart a stronger rebound from the recession. They're all but certain to keep their benchmark overnight rate unchanged when they wrap up their two-day meeting today. The Fed releases a statement at 2 p.m. New York time. Fed Chair Jerome Powell holds a news conference 30 minutes later. And Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos plans to tell Congress today that his company is an American success story with a relentless focus on customers, according to prepared testimony. The world's richest person will strike a patriotic tone for his appearance before the House Antitrust Subcommittee. Bezos will be joined by the CEOs of Facebook, Apple and Google parent Alphabet. The UK is moving to snap up supplies of future coronavirus vaccines. It signed a deal with partners GlaxoSmithKline and Sanofi to obtain as many as 60 million doses of their experimental shot. The companies also are in talks to sell the vaccine to the US, the European Union and global organizations. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Date, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
obviously happy to be out of the state of Florida because I feel like um, Florida is just starting to spike and it's becoming this epicenter, um, which is definitely somewhere where I don't want to be. Um, so I'm happy that we got the test, we cleared negative, and then we were just out of there. Last year, we took you inside the political turmoil gripping Hong Kong. This year, Beijing tightened its position with a new national security law. Will this jeopardize Hong Kong's position as a global financial center? And will China face the consequences from abroad? I'm Stephen Engel. We take a second look at the crisis facing the city in a Bloomberg television special, Hong Kong on Edge 2. investors that something will get done. Um, it'll probably happen at the you know, 25th hour. It'll probably happen at the beginning of August and get retroactively applied to the end of July. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, neither party wants to be liable for a mini fiscal cliff. David Leibovich there of J.P. Morgan Investment Management on the next steps down in Washington on the fiscal front. From New York City this morning, good morning. Alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Abravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Here's your Wednesday morning price action shaping up as follows. Risk appetite builds just a little bit. Up four in the S&P, we advance a little more than a tenth of 1%. The euro getting back to where it was a couple of days ago. Euro dollar 117.31. And in the bond market, yields leaking just a little bit higher. On a 10-year, upper basis point to 0.59%. Tom, the faith in Washington amongst people on Wall Street is absolutely remarkable. Just yeah. the very idea that we have something like the election put. The election is the incentive for everyone to come together and get it done. Well, now under 100 days, and of course, the vice presidential announcement of Mr. Biden will be more interesting here in a few days. Right now, let's focus on the stimulus. Kevin Cirilli uh, with us, our uh, Bloomberg Chief Washington correspondent. Kevin, just simple. What happens on Wednesday? Well, I think uh, two things. And for, first and foremost, the big tech hearings are going to drive a lot of the conversation coming out of the Beltway today. But in terms of economic stimulus, I'm told that the conversations are going to continue today amongst Republicans and Democrats. Speaker Pelosi, Tom, yesterday saying that it was a non-starter and that Leader McConnell was not being serious to continue to push for these liability protections for businesses. However, I'm told that there are actually some centrist Democrats behind the scenes who would be able to get on well, board with such <clears throat> of that. Uh, in, in the House. Either way, uh, the breakthrough for McConnell is going to have to come at some point uh, should he get this to a vote by the end of the week in the Senate. He's got to rally his own caucus first. These issues beg compromise. Did you see any whiff of compromise or discussion of compromise? Yes, between Speaker Pelosi and Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, who have developed a real frank candor in working together over the fiscal cliffs of the past couple of years. However, and this is where it gets, this is where the personalities are impacting the policies and the politics, which is how uh, there are several Republicans, uh, especially in the House, who are saying they don't necessarily want Speaker Pelosi meeting with Treasury Secretary Mnuchin solo. They would like to make sure that the that the Treasury Secretary Secretary is bringing along some members of Congress. So this triangulation between Republicans on the Hill, Speaker Pelosi, and now the, the administration 
is, is quite interesting to watch that dynamic unfold. Well, Kevin, this dynamic is interesting because this is going to be the approach going forward. It's not to please the Republicans, the fiscal hawks. They're not even going to bother trying. They're going to try and form some kind of coalition with the Democrats to get this through the Senate. And for the scope, I think, for negotiation, I think when it comes to getting money in consumers' pockets, the scope to do more here. The president was asked about this yesterday in the news conference, and he was incredibly relaxed. He almost called the bill, I think he did call the bill, semi-irrelevant, Kevin. And I just wonder what that means for how much more they can offer in terms of how can consumers get that money directly. Well, two things. First and foremost, it's incredibly relevant to the millions of Americans who are needing that type of not just cash to come, but also uh, their, their employers to get access to that capital to, to protect their long-term uh, interests in terms of staying employed. However, the president yesterday, speaking in, in incredibly, remarkably clear terms, in which he noted that he felt his dip in the polls is a personality problem. His words, that when he looks at Dr. Fauci uh, and, the, and the popularity of Dr. Birx, uh, in contrast it with his own. And there's this sense of reality sinking in the president's inner circle that as it relates to the economy, the, the real final contrast is going to come in the next round of stimulus. And I know we've got to get through this one first, Jonathan, but the next round of stimulus comes September or October, right before uh, the, the presidential election. But Kevin, President Trump isn't even in Washington today. Today he is traveling to Texas to raise money for his campaign, as well as to talk about energy policy policy in the United States in the Permian Basin. How helpful is it to Republicans for the Trump uh, campaign to come out yesterday, say that they disagree with many aspects of the Republican bill, and then leave town? Well, you know, I think I think it, it shows the the political reality of the moment in in a state that should be a shoe in for the president to carry on November third uh, that he's <coughs> campaigning there and fundraising. However, yeah. I think the dynamics of the contrast of him trying to talk about energy policy during a week where the Biden campaign has continued to roll out their economic uh, uh, agenda as it relates to energy is a contrast that Republicans want to have. They want to draw a contrast with energy. A especially in states like Texas, Pennsylvania, uh, and, and other battleground states as well. Hey, Kevin, I want to rip up the script here and just take a vignette of late July into August, which is not in my backyard. The fact is the good senator from South Carolina, Mr. Graham, has the pandemic in his backyard. The statistics for South Carolina on a per capita basis are absolutely appalling. They're on the edge of Arizona. Does that change the behavior of politicians in Washington? Yes, and in fact, I think that there's this 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 interesting uh, frustration amongst Republicans and increasingly amongst Democrats, uh, but with Republicans and the president, when he originally started talking about the economic realities, the president described himself as a wartime president uh, and invoked to many uh, Roosevelt and FDR and 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 some of the uh, the economic stimulus that happened in the 1940s. You know, I think back to the conversation uh, that in, in 1940 with regards to infrastructure and highways. And I think that what you're going to see from Biden over the next couple of months is invoking that Roosevelt type of field, Tom, as it relates to, to building not just roads and bridges, but, but 5G infrastructure as well. So I, I think that the messaging here has been muffled on both sides, uh, but it's still only, you know, we're heading into August, uh, and I think that, that both both sides are going to have to sharpen their economic pitches uh, in st to states like South Carolina, for example, uh, in order uh, to, to really provide some clarity, not just to the markets, but to swing voters. Kevin, I asked you yesterday who we should be following, listening to. Who should we, should we be ignoring down in Washington today? Who should, oh, I'm going to get in trouble, Jonathan. <laughs> well, I'm just putting you on the spot here, buddy. I, just I, think, think about it. Take I, a minute. I, Have a you breather. You know, I'm going I'm to say that I would uh, not be paying attention. I'm going to dodge. Don't pay attention to Twitter, but pay <laughs> attention, pay attention to, to the to CEOs. Twitter. But pay attention well, to the CEOs on the big tech. Yeah. Senator Cruz or Senator Sass? Yeah. Who would you pay attention to? You know, I pay attention to Senator Sass in the short term, but I think if, if you're, if you're, if you know, the calculation for Senator Cruz is that he's laying a marker for 2024, uh, and he's and he's, uh, you know, he's saying that he's going to inherit some of the the fiscal conservative conservatism ideology uh, after this. But we're still in the thick of things in the fog of an economic calamity, uh, and I think a lot of uh, Republicans understand. John Cerilli is such an animal of the belt. <laughs> I know, honestly, he's just such an animal <laughs> What's of the belt. 
say, Tom, that was on. everything I despise about journalism. Oh, come on. Just, just scared wow. to say what you really think. Kevin, oh. you're better than that. You're better than that. I know what you really think, though. When Kevin turns around and says, in the short term, listen to Senator Sass, yeah. In the long term, do you ignore him then? <laughs> you know, you know, you know. I, look, I think it doesn't matter what I think. I just want to be a <laughs> Kevin, reporter. Kevin, you're that. wonderful. I'm in trouble. No, I'm you're sweating. <laughs> Kevin, run. <laughs> Kevin's already there. Thank you, Chief Washington correspondent. Tom, that was, of course, very unfair of me. Yes. Well, yeah, you, you know, it's unfair, but Kevin is like everybody else down there. They're in their own little prism inside the Beltway. It's a cliche, but it's true. He's fantastic. Coming up, Jill Carey Hall of Bank of America from New York. This is Bloomberg. Opportunity knocks at the door. Don't say, blimey, I've still got my pyjamas on. Say yes to stuff and it will take you into some places. We're clearly going through some very unusual uh, times uh, and, you know, e enormous uh, difficulties uh, getting groups of people to agree on things. From Bloomberg's European headquarters in the city of London, join us on Leaders with Lacqua. data flowing seamlessly. We keep on so you can keep on. I am David Weston. Bloomberg Television is reinventing one of the most iconic brands in financial television for a new audience. Join me to see the news program for the clever investor. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. From New York City, this 
It's Bloomberg Surveillance for our audience worldwide. We're live on Bloomberg TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Here's your price action this Wednesday morning. What a day we've got coming up down on Capitol Hill. You will hear from the big tech CEOs. You will hear more on the fiscal talks, and we will get a Fed decision in Washington a little bit later this afternoon. In the FX market, the euro's firmer, the dollar's weaker. Euro dollar 117.33. Yields bleeding higher on a 10-year to 0.59%. And equity futures with a mild lift, Tom, with flat on the week into Wednesday. Equity futures up about five, a little more than a tenth of one percent. Yeah, nice lift right now in futures. We'll see where we go as we go up to this big technology soiree. I know, John, you want to go there with our next guest, but I've got to ask her a housekeeping question first. Jill Carey Hall works within the competitive milieu of economics and equity at Bank of America. What she's known for is a blistering single sentence in a three-page report. Jill, you have a sentence which is stunning which is small caps will see a 90% year-over-year collapse of earnings versus large caps with only a 40% collapse of earnings. How does small cap get to the end of the bridge? Yeah, I mean, the, the fundamental backdrop for small caps is one of the reasons we've been cautious. I think, obviously, the the, the coronavirus and the current crisis ha has been one that's been more detrimental to small businesses. But even going into this, small caps were worse positioned than they usually are ahead of recessions. You had about a third of the, the Russell 2000 that had no earnings. You had record debt levels. Um, and now this this earnings season, as you mentioned, you're seeing much, much bigger year-over-year uh, -year earnings collapses for smaller companies. Companies and, and they're still seeing weaker revision trends, even though we're starting to see a bottoming out there. So, so we're still cautious for smaller companies. But, but as you, if you move into a more sustainable recovery, um, you know, while it may take a bit longer than than usual, given where they were, that that typically tends to be a more favorable backdrop for smaller caps. But, but for now, we remain more relatively cautious there. Well, Jill, just walk me through the earnings profile relative to the price of the story: large caps versus small caps now. Sure. So, I mean, right now on a valuation basis, all three size segments are trading at, at pretty extended levels versus history. So, so relative to earnings, the market certainly doesn't look look cheap, no matter what size segment you're looking at. Um, but, but for from a relative basis, if you're a long term investor, that's sort of the the long term bull case for small caps is relative to large. They're trading at at multi decade lows. Valuation doesn't really tend to be very predictive if you have a short time horizon. You know, with the PE multiple of the market is today it doesn't really necessarily tell you much about what returns you're going to get over yeah. the next year but if you have you know a 10-year long-term horizon <clears throat> then that does tend to be more predictive so so for a long-term investor it could be a good entry point for small caps but but for the near near term we still remain cautious Jill, when you're thinking about these numbers and considering the price of the story just how much is it distorted by the big four these big tech names that we'll be reporting to capitol hill today yeah, for the S&P 500 overall, we've definitely seen a, a lot of the, the returns this year driven by, by mega caps and bang stocks amid all of the, the unprecedented uh, liquidity that we've seen. We're equal weight the, the tech sector right now. We, we have seen pretty strong earnings trends. It's been one of the sectors that this earnings season so far uh, has continued to surprise to the upside along with healthcare. Um, it has some of the cleanest balance sheets in the S&P. So fundamentally, the sector still looks strong, but... You know, you have seen valuations get more and more extended, and one of the reasons that we're equal weight tech within the S&P 500 is potential for, for higher regulation, whether some of these companies wind up self-regulating or whether it's forced upon them. I think that's something that, you know, as we move into election, and regardless, it's something that both sides of the aisle have, have talked about. So uh, obviously, we saw what happened with financials and regulation and, and lower multiples. So that's one, one potential concern around tech stocks. Jill, high regulation is one issue, but that can't erase the fact that we've seen an acceleration in the trend toward tech, toward working from home, toward the cloud. And I'm wondering how much this affects the small caps and the, fa and the fact that perhaps some of these companies are more leveraged to the old economy, the one that did didn't depend on tech as much, and perhaps that's one of the reasons why those shares are down 11% versus the almost 17% gain on the NASDAQ. How much is this a structural challenge for small cap stocks going forward? Right. I think that's exactly right, that that's one of the issues when we've looked at the, the earnings exposure of small caps. They actually have about double the earnings exposure to some of what we would consider more secularly challenged industries, like some of those old, economist, on, old economy industries you mentioned, like REITs, um, you know, machinery, 
part, parts of uh, re old brick and mortar retail relative to large caps. So, and the areas of small caps that, that are more tech exposed, you know, small cap software, some of these areas are where you have seen those, those valuation mm. multiples go more stratospheric. So, you know, overall within small caps, investing in in growth stocks does tend to be well, a, a more consistent longer term strategy you know, than, than for large, but but yes, more more exposure to older. Jill, it may be micro caps, small caps, who's keeping count? In the old days, when revenue was this damaged and particularly unit growth was this damaged, you did a roll up, everybody merged, et cetera. Is the apparatus out there right now, the catalyst, the incentives to get one big M and A of the small cap space? think certainly you know m a it, it tends to be cyclical so you know yeah. while, while certainly you're, you're you can still see some some occur during during downturns and then it tends to pick up cyclically um you know that when we when you look for companies that could be acquisition targets that that tends to be one potential strategy in small caps um, but but I think overall right now we're seeing a broader picture of, you know, uncertainty over cash deployment from corporates. That's a theme we're seeing this earnings season where even though, you know, a lot of companies have have, have stopped, uh, you know, a lot of the buyback and dividend suspensions may, may largely be behind us to the overall market. Yeah, but You're not necessarily seeing I, I don't mean to interrupt, but, but Jill, I'm, I'm baffled by this. In the small cap space, if I'm at four times EBITDA, seven times EBITDA, maybe even seven, eight times EBITDA, somebody at Bank of America or one of your competitors gets on the phone and says, you can't grow yourself out of this, merge. Is that mechanism broken? I don't think it's broken. I, I think, as you say, for, for a lot of small caps, there, there are attractive acquisition targets, and this has been a very good market for not only for stock picking, but for just very differentiated, uh, you know, valuations within the market. So I think, you know, what one of the things to, to look at is is for small caps, you know, a lot of companies that, that have, you know, attractive free cash flow, the ability to grow. Um, we, we've seen companies that are, are very over levered within small caps overall. So, you know, I think kind of separating out some, some of these metrics and, you know, just as an investor looking at the small cap size segment, even if it's a, if, if, even if this is a point where as we expect value could, could continue to, to start to work, um, you know, differentiating within small caps, what's more quality value from, you know, levered risk within small caps um, and, and companies that still do have that potential to grow. Jill, since you're uh, having a pretty cautious tone and a lot of people come on this program and they say that they're actually going more into small caps as a way to capture some of the upside on this recovery. What do you say against the argument that these companies will benefit more from a weaker dollar, more from a, a bigger resurgence internationally as a result of that? Yeah, I mean, I think when we, you know, when small caps overall have grown more internationally exposed over time, so the the gap between small and large caps foreign exposure has has narrowed. They are still more domestically exposed. When we've looked at the the dollar versus relative performance over time, it actually hasn't been very predictive in that you know you've seen some periods of, of secular dollar strength where small caps have underperformed, some where they've outperformed. So really, what we found is that the overall economic backdrop and, and what's going on. Um, tends to be more predictive than just the level of the dollar itself. Jill, what do you say to people who slough off the idea of bankruptcy or some sort of contagion among smaller companies saying the Fed has their back, fiscal stimulus will also help support them? Do you think that this optimistic view is perhaps overplayed at this point? Well, I think, you know, certainly we're, we expect to remain in a lower for longer beat rates backdrop. We expect the Fed to remain accommodative. But, you know, in terms of the, the unprecedented fiscal and monetary stimulus we've seen, you know, one of the reasons that we're, we're cautious on the market and, and the S&P 500 overall um, in terms of not really expecting more more upside through year end is that we, we expect there could be payback risk from all the stimulus we've seen and that a lot of the the biggest stimulus has largely been been behind us, and certainly there's potential for more to, to help the economy. But um, you know, we we've seen diminishing returns from stimulus in terms of the the boosts we've seen to lower quality stocks, as we've seen each consecutive instance those get less and less of a boost. So 
Um, I think it'll remain an accommodative backdrop, but but a lot of the, the biggest boost we've seen ha has been in the past. We're seeing fading collective will as well. Jill, great to catch up with you. Jill Kerry Hall there of Bank of America. Tom Keane, that's the story, isn't it? The diminishing marginal return of every dollar you put yeah. into the system to stimulate the economy. We've seen the big package. We've seen the big boom. The problem right now is how much bang for your buck do you get from here and how much willingness is there down in Washington, D.C. to do even more? What you said there, John, on marginal, folks, the word marginal within Pharaoh Babel means the next, the next labor employed, the next dollar invested, and on and on. And the marginal calculus right now, John, is absolutely critical. I think it's way underestimated uh, within the zeitgeist out there. And Tom, I'm usually careful with my words, and I think many people might have heard the big boom and thought, what is he talking about? The thing is, Tom, the amount of fiscal stimulus that was put into the system, <clears throat> and I didn't like the word stimulus to begin with, the amount of fiscal cash that was put yeah, into the system, yeah, Tom, yeah. that has really held this economy up. <clears throat> this would have been a whole lot worse over the last couple of months right. if we didn't have that monster package. Well, there's no question. Al Broadus mentioned that as well. But what's really interesting here across the conversations we're having, John, is is it stimulus for the short term or can there be a longer term view on it as there is more so in Europe? And the jury's out on that. Got to talk about the tech hearings as well. Tom Keane, just for a flavor of what Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg are going to say today, it's interesting <coughs> that they're just starting to, just starting to think about patriotism. And the United States versus China. I'm just, John, and, I'm, and you need us for America and Americans. Yeah. We're going to hear a lot about oh, that come on. a little they're bit gonna, later. They're going to first do no harm. They're going to just try to get Absolutely. through this thing smiling. Objective number one. I just want to hear if there's an entry point to these stocks. I'm still, you know, triple leverage all cash. I know I just you are. hope they give me an entry you point. You know who's here. happy today? Sassy Nadella. Not there. He's not there. Well said. Very, well, well very said. Very happy, I'm yeah, sure. well said. Coming Absolutely. up on this program, Jim McAlvey, Square co-founder, on those hearings down on Capitol Hill from New York City this morning. Good morning. Futures up sixth. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Rishka Gupta. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has drawn a line in the sand on a new stimulus package. He's insisting that his proposed changes to liability law be included wholesale in the legislation. That's bogged down talks between President Trump's representatives and Democrats. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says it shows McConnell's not serious about reaching a deal. Mixed news on the coronavirus pandemic front in the U.S. Florida reported a record number of deaths, but new infections slowed down in two states grappling with outbreaks, California and Arizona. And the positive test rate in Texas fell to the lowest in a month. And the Trump administration and the Oregon governor's office reportedly are in talks about pulling federal agents out of Portland, according to the Associated Press. The state would have to beef up law enforcement in return. Earlier this week, there was talk of sending more federal agents to Portland because of protests and vandalism. Joe Biden says he'll pick his vice presidential nominee next week, and he told reporters he'll let them know as soon as he does. The Democratic presidential nominee has pledged to pick a woman running mate. Last week, Biden said the group of candidates includes four black women, amongst others. And Visa is starting to benefit from the slow reopening of American cities, but the credit card network isn't willing to predict what the next two months will bring. Visa says spending rose almost 10% in recent weeks. Still, that wasn't enough for the company to offer guidance for its full-year performance. And in Hong Kong, the economy shrank for the fourth quarter in a row. The coronavirus pandemic and political unrest extended the city's first recession in a decade. Hong Kong's GDP fell a worse than expected 9% in the second quarter from a year ago. The unemployment rate has risen to a 15-year high. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Best, your weekly review of the most important business news analysis and interviews from Bloomberg Television around the world. Ken Burns, welcome to Bloomberg Big Decisions. We have always been a mixture of things. We are always stronger for that mixture. Growth is a way to stay competitive, delight more and more consumers. Welcome to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. They've moved the needle by acknowledging that they have to monitor the content. What is one word of advice you'll take with you? learn how to listen and that is certainly something that has served me well. Ankiti, where do you go from here? It's a huge market, it's a huge opportunity. I want to go 100x from here. Our philosophy is to partner where we can and stand apart when we should. Some things you see coming, some things you don't. The trick is to be ready for anything. John from Infrastructure Support is working every day to keep essential market data flowing seamlessly. We keep on so you can keep on. market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. We're always looking and, and we look at things through the lens of value and uh, we have to see a, a good portfolio fit and so there are strategic screens that we look at for any transaction. We've got a pretty high bar. the momentum continue, and I, and I think against antitrust, right, I think what that's going to do is going to slow down M&A, and I think if you start to get a Democrat-controlled Senate with a Biden White House, you know, that's something that the ambassadors start to really factor in. This is more of a risk. Regulatory risk, that's something you'll hear a lot about today. Dan Ives of Wedbush Securities, Managing Director there from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your price action shaping up as follows this Wednesday morning. Equity futures on the S&P 500 drifting a little bit higher, up two-tenths on the S&P 500. The euro strength is back. A comeback this Wednesday. Euro New order placed for British pound. Sell short at 129.679. So new order placed to sell short British pound at 129.679. Splintered, just different approaches from different Republicans, different Democrats. Well, I think we can walk away comfortable with the knowledge that they're not anywhere near implementing right. anything that changes these business models anytime soon. Folks, John and I went mental on this, and that for the next nine hours, there's going to be a complete mythology of these gazillionaires these technology giants and these politicians as they spar in Washington. What we wanted to do is have a sane conversation with a doer, someone like Cook, someone like Bezos, and the rest of them. Jim McKelvey is the McKelvey School of Engineering at the Washington University of St. Louis. He stumbled on a thing with a guy named Dorsey called Square and made a pile of money. But that came out of his curiosity and his innovation in everything from glass blowing to just simple engineering and Pascal language from another time and place. We're thrilled Jim McKelvey can talk today about these four people who are going to stand in front of our Congress. Jim, thrilled to have you uh, with us as well. You are like Bezos. You are like Cook. You're like the rest of them. You guys aren't normal. What's your message to these congressmen? <laughs> what? No, come on. What's your message to these congressmen about the innovation you guys had when you were 15 or 20 or 25? So, I mean, it's exactly the opposite of what you just said. Um, and the order to sell short British pounds removed. It's moved too fast, too far. I'll wait for another turn. Um, I mean, it's, it's literally the opposite of you said. I'm a very normal guy. I live in St. Louis. 
Um, I, I'm not a genius. I'm not even that hardworking. I'm no good at running companies. So um, what I wanted to do was figure out what can take a normal person and put them in a position where someday they do run a company so powerful they get hauled in front of Congress. Will Washington block that innovation? Is that a risk that's out there? Look, there's always a risk from regulation, and when regulation comes, it usually doesn't come in sort of precise uh, surgical implements. But uh, I don't think Washington's going to do that much. Um, but uh, then again, I'm not a legislator. I'm not even somebody who runs a company, so I'm not really qualified to speak on that. Uh, at, at best, I'm somebody who spent a lot of time studying the dynamics of these companies. And in I, I would say this, as somebody who is very regulated, I believe in regulation. But you want regulation to be consistent so that the companies and the people who work for them uh, can adjust and uh, you know not have to lurch back and forth. Jim, I want to take Tom's question and, and turn it on its head, the idea that perhaps Washington can uh, squelch innovation. Are big tech companies squelching innovation? This is one of the big questions, as perhaps the idea of Amazon taking out and, and eliminating some of the platforms for competitors or, or sort of pushing them down on the search function in order to uh, pr basically push forward their own products first. Is that stifling innovation? Well, look, I don't know exactly what Amazon's doing, but I, I will tell you this. I mean, the reason I wrote the book was because uh, Amazon in its early days attacked Square, and they copied our product, they undercut our price, and everyone expected Square to die, um, and we didn't. Um, and uh, you know, a year later, Amazon gave up uh, processing credit cards. And, um, and honestly, competing with them, they were really gracious when they left the credit card business they mailed all i think we might have lost the connection there with jim mccalvey the square co-founder and deputy chair of the st louis fed tom i like how he played down how normal he might not be and how normal yeah, you he hear thinks that he all is the time. come on he is insanely intelligent i mean, Let I me mean just clear that john up. The, you and i hear this in davos in every single techie techie bar all these guys are begging <laughs> to tell us they're normal are you kidding me Jim. folks you know i want to bring this up this is so important this no. kid donated 15 million to washington university yeah. to build an engineering school john these guys put their money where their mouth is and it's jobs in capitalism jim i'll say it for you you are fiercely intelligent let's continue this conversation shall we the competition that you got from Amazon. Do you think that made Square better? Um, actually, it was almost irrelevant. The funny <laughs> thing about what happened with, with Amazon was that um, because we had an innovation stack, which is this weird thing that I've been studying for three years, the competition really didn't happen in a way that was traditional. So if you've got normal businesses, which are basically sort of very close copies of each other, then competition uh, is can be deadly. And when Amazon does this to normal companies, it wipes them out. Um, but in the case of Square and some other companies that have these things called innovation stacks, you're actually uh, almost competition proof, at least as long as you play by a certain set of rules that you know I spent three years studying. So I think um, it, you know everyone expected it to be this giant battle. Um, but at Square, we really didn't do anything different. And by the way, that pattern repeats in, in dozens of companies that I have studied, uh, in, in, including one, you know, Bank of America, the founding of Bank of America. Um, it was done by a kid who dropped out of school at 15 years old, um, no formal education. He was a produce yeah, but, vendor. But Jim, Jim I don't mean to interrupt, but we're going to run out of time. Jim, this is critical. Is Washington going to get in the way of that innovation stack? No, Washington's not going to do it because they can't. Um, the companies with innovation stacks adapt very, very quickly. What Washington needs to do is just lay out the rules. They need to talk about what's important. Um, if there if there needs to be some protection, they put in some protection. But what we need as innovators is to just know the rules that we're playing in. Hey, Jim, great to catch up with you. Brilliant. Five minutes does not do this justice. We've <clears throat> got to get you back. Jim McCalvey there, Square co-founder and deputy chair of the St. Louis Fed. Ahead of the testimonies a little bit later today, Tom, I mentioned Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. Here's a quote from him, and this will be in his testimony today. We believe in values that the American economy was built on. Many other tech companies share these values, but there's no guarantee our values will win out. For example, China is building its own version of the Internet focused on very different ideas. This will be the story later, Tom. The United States doing it for America, patriotism versus China. You'll hear it from Zuckerberg. You'll hear it from Bezos, too. 
and I wonder how much it resonates. I wonder, John, as well, as of what we're going to hear from Congress. Are these guys going to speak, or are they going to get lectured to? My guess is it'll be more of getting lectured They'll to. They'll get to speak, and then they'll get lectured for a number of hours, I'm sure. Coming up on the program, the other big event down in Washington, the Federal Reserve decides. Priya Misra of TV Securities coming up next. From New York City this morning, alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures up a quarter of 1%. <coughs> Heard on Bloomberg Radio, seen on Bloomberg TV. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. True diversification. That's what adding commodities exposure to your stock and bond portfolio can help provide. The Bloomberg Commodity Index is the standard for commodity market exposure. 23 traded commodities are represented. Agriculture, livestock, metals, and energy. The Bloomberg Commodity Index is the benchmark most widely used by investment professionals globally. Track your commodity investments with a proven financial information partner. The Bloomberg Commodity Index. True diversification. sense of the real-time action, the 10-year yield tumbling now 11 basis points, so continuing in this knee-jerk, risk-off field. When everything around us, including the way we work and live, has been interrupted, uninterrupted service is peace of mind. GZ from Customer Support is responding to a 500% increase in daily call volume.
lift off, the real problem is traction. You will see some investors begin to take some chips off the table. You're already seeing it in the futures data and embrace a little bit more of a cyclical value view. Well, well, I hope, certainly, uh, that policymakers this time round will recognize that fiscal has to do more of the heavy lifting in terms of supporting the uh, recovery. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keene. We are in New York, but the story is in Washington. A hat trick of themes to get through the morning. Yes, a Fed meeting at 2. I'll be there with Caroline uh, Hyde helping out with some good conversation. None of it matters. What matters is the, the drama, the pageantry, John. Uh, four guys from Silicon Valley lined up like ducks in front of Congress. And, oh, yeah, the stimulus debate. John, which has your attention? Funny enough, Tom, the Federal Reserve, only because I think so many people are playing it down. We're about to see a shift to accommodation, in Governor Brainerd's words. And a lot of people have sort of shaken their head at that and thought, what on earth is she talking about? What was the last three months about? But we are about <coughs> to see a shift away from the accommodation we've seen in the last three months towards much more forward guidance and this commitment, this shift in the reaction function to formalize yeah. that and this commitment to low for a whole lot longer. Forward, and I think that's important. Forward guidance, folks, that just means the x-axis, the queen of the x-axis, Lisa Bramow, it's here uh, as well. Lisa, what's lower for longer? Are we going to go out to 2023 today? The question is, where is lower longer, right? Are we talking about the front end? Because very clearly, they're not going to raise rates anytime soon. The question is, what are going to be some of the measurements they look to in order to decide what their policy is? Are they going to set inflation pegs? Are they going to set uh, employment uh, pegs? And is 2% target yeah. for inflation relevant in 2020, Tom? Well, the job dynamic to me, folks, is the biggest, biggest variable now. For Lisa, I know it's an update of IG and high yield. What are they? We're going to do full faith and credit here. Uh, Lisa, right now, but what's IG and high yield done in the last couple days? Not much. They've actually flatlined, and this is because they've got that backstop from the Federal Reserve, this belief that they will continue suppressing borrowing costs globally, and you're seeing right. companies take advantage of that. <clears throat> Going forward, though, at what point do fundamentals start to matter again, Tom? Well, the fundamental is the nominal yield here, the 10-year yield, 0.58%. John, do a data check, and then why don't you... With the real yield, your property that we see on the weekends, why don't you bring in our good guests? You love how he does this. It's Gives great. me permission. <laughs> Gives me permission to do a market check. You do a market check. I, I do like a market check there. right now in my own time. I'm going to take this slowly. Equity futures look a little something like this this morning. Good morning to you all from New York. We're up two tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. Single currency, we roll over in the last 10 minutes. Just a bit of dollar strength kicking back in. The dollar positive on the session now. Euro dollar 117.21. We are flat on that currency pair. Yields up a single basis point going into the Fed. 0.59 percent on a U.S. 10-year. Tom Keane, let's bring in Priya Misra, shall we? TD Securities Global Head of Rate Strategy joins us right now. Priya. I think you agree with me that this is more important than people are letting on later today. What are you looking for in the news conference with Chair Jake Powell? Right. It's all going to be about the news conference because I, I don't expect any changes in the statement. We don't get the dot plot. We don't get projections. So it's all about how does he set the stage for forward guidance and how does he frame the QE? You know, is QE all about market functioning? Because if that's the case, then they should continue to buy across the curve. But market functioning has largely returned to normal. So are we going to see a, a, a reduction in QE? I've actually been you know, reading between the lines. A lot of the Fed officials have been talking about more accommodation. Well, one way they can provide more accommodation is to change the narrative of QE itself from being something about market functioning, which it did a great job, but it's, it's sort of done, I think, to now provide accommodation to keep long-term rates low. I think if we get that shift in narrative, the market's uh, you know, going to understand that the Fed is going to move further out the curve. That's going to help real rates decline some bit. I think we've started to price this in. If you look across assets, the, the dollar, gold, real rates, break-evens, all telling you that the market's setting up for sort of, I hate saying normal, but effectively normal QE, which is that the, the, the intent of QE is to keep long-term rates low. I think we really need to hear that from Chair Powell because we've been setting up for that for the last couple of weeks. Priya, when you hear Governor Brainerd say things like we need to shift away from stabilization to accommodation, do you hear yield curve control? I think she has been a proponent of yield curve control, and we were thinking that that's likely to happen this year. But from recent Fed communication, not everybody's on board. It's a completely new policy tool. 
How do you get out of yield curve control? So I still think it's going to be in the policy toolkit, but something they can do, you know, from the existing tools is certainly link forward guidance to inflation, effectively suggesting a much more dovish reaction function. If they had this reaction function in 2015, they wouldn't have hiked because core PCE was significantly below two. So I think they can do that with existing outcome-based forward guidance. They can also just shift the QE. So effectively provide accommodation, you know, giving them time until they actually analyze yield curve control. I do think they may have to do that next year. Priya, the idea that you talked about, this is huge. The idea that the Fed could come out and say, we are going to actively try to suppress longer term borrowing costs for the United States, basically monetizing the United States debt. That would have a torpedo effect on the dollar, wouldn't it? I think that the part of the weakness in the dollar in the last couple of weeks, I think, is the market sort of listening to the Fed and saying that's probably the next step. So I think, uh, but absolutely, I think if they are very clear that they're going to keep long-term rates low, that should weaken the dollar. Now, a lot with the dollar, a lot does depend on, uh, you know, what's happen, uh, happening globally. If global growth is going to research, then that can certainly take the dollar much weaker. I'm a little more pessimistic. I think, um, you know, I'm not sure that global growth necessarily picks up. So I think that ultimately will put a floor on the dollar. Plus, we have an election coming up. So there's a lot of other things going on with the dollar, too. Priya, it's away from your remit, but tell me about the labor economy. I mean, I'm sorry, it's part of their mandate. It's not good. How do you take the prism of the labor economy and fold it over into lower for longer? So I think, um, you know, clearly it's it's part of their mandate. When we look at the labor market, I think we've seen the improvement from reopening, also from stimulus, which is why this whole stimulus discussion is important. Our fear is that the labor economy is going to start to stall. As we realize that the we're reopening to a new normal, there'll be parts of the, the labor economy that cannot get back to normal because it's the social distancing, well, et cetera. Okay. Okay, but Priya, this is important. I got to make some news here. Are you on the glide path of Steve Major at HSBC or what we see out of some of the people at JP Morgan of a lower 10 year yield and even a 10 year yield that could threaten the zero bound? Yes, I think for the zero bound, it's a little bit hard because the Fed can just let up on the amount that they're buying. But we actually do see lower 10 year yields in the near term. I think August seasonals are typically positive. We're seeing the recovery stall, and you have a dovish Fed that's going to start buying out the curve. I think that's going to actually, uh, tens could absolutely touch bottom in the very near term. Priya, this is so, so difficult for a rate strategist right now, for anyone in this bond market. We touched on this in the last hour. How do you have some kind of call on the yield curve, when you can have a Fed step in with yield curve control, even if you think inflation expectations are going to pick up because they'll tolerate higher inflation, haven't you just got to follow the Fed? Just the idea that whatever the Fed does is where the yield curve is going to go. Right. Well, I think there's a reaction function component. Then there's the actual economic data. And I think what we're all struggling with is we can't extrapolate from any of the economic data we've been seeing, right? Because the, the weakness was all about the lockdown. Now the improvement seems to be all about reopening. So we're looking at these high frequency measures to try and estimate, is the recovery stalling? We're all becoming epidemiologists. So we're looking at the virus rate death rate, unfortunately, depressing topics. But, you know, once you have that, if the Fed clarifies the reaction function, the market can then start to look at the data and then start to price in what happens to rates. But, I, you know, we're also looking at supply demand. If we're going to get another one and a half trillion more of supply, then I think this Fed buying becomes extremely critical to pick what, you know, how, where exactly is the tenure, what does that yield curve look like? You're right, more um, variables to look at now. Priya, we're all becoming epidemiologists because this is a health problem. It's not a financial system problem. And I have to wonder if the Fed comes out and provides even more accommodation, what does that do at this point with near record low borrowing costs across the board? I think it buys time. Does it prevent something like a taper tantrum? Let's say we get a vaccine soon, and I hope that we do. We get a vaccine, but it's going to take a while for that to you know, be effective for, for consumer confidence, business confidence to come back. I think where the Fed can absolutely help is keep things accommodative until we can get the public health response, until we realize that actually we're going back to normal, then they can take it back. I think that's the key, just to prevent some sort of big tightening in conditions because suddenly there's optimism about a vaccine. I think so, so they, they can be more preemptive they can just at least assure the market, take risk premium out and help risk assets. And they've done a great job so far. 
But I think they may have to do more on treasuries given how much supply is going to come down the pipe. Priya, you know I love catching up with you. We love catching up with you. Priya Misra there of TD Securities. And Lisa knows what Tom hates. And Tom, that's the idea that a central bank will pick a point at the long end of the curve and just sit on it and not let it move. Uh, it's a tried experiment, but we are not Japan. I, I just don't see the And the Treasury market parallel. is not the JGB market, Tom. Yeah, absolutely. Let's be clear about that. I, I just don't get it. Tom, you've brought the up the analysis. payrolls report in the coming weeks. Mm. Let me bring you the estimates on that, just the spread. Thank you. And I think it's the spread that's going to be interesting. The high estimate right now is positive 3.3 million. The low is negative <laughs> 1 million. And it's that spread. Just how unpredictable that payrolls report is right now between some people who think we might get a negative print, Tom, for the month of July, and some people think we might get more of the yeah. same, more positive reads. Yeah, I think it's all out there. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy uh, what we're going to see here on August 7th. And I'm going to go back to claims tomorrow. John, my bow tie's been a disaster all morning. What's wrong with it? Fix it. It doesn't look good for radio. Do you, you think know? we should switch one day <clears throat> for a charity event? You we can should have the do slim, that. You can have the slim <laughs> Paul Smith and... What are you wearing today? What charity? This is uh, a French startup company. A French startup company? Yeah, MS. Um, yeah, that would be it. It's Federated Hermes, one of the two. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah, what charity would that go to? We've got to decide. People should write in. I'd love to do that. We'll do a charity day, Tom. That's what? I wear a bow tie. You wear a nice skinny tie. I think it'll suit you. Coming up on this program, Tom Porcelli, RBC Capital Markets Chief, U.S. Economist from New York City this morning. Good morning. Here's the price action. Let's whip through it for you. S&P 500 futures up nine. On the S&P, we advance by a third of 1%. Outside of that, the dollar making a bit of a comeback in the last 30 minutes or so. The dollar's stronger, stronger on the day. That means euro dollar comes back down to 117.26. Yields up ahead of the Fed, now unchanged, 0.58%. Just really sticky. Priya Misra talking to this. They were just really trapped in this very... <coughs> Yeah. tight range. Yes. We had a bit of a breakout to the downside, but still in at around 60 basis points. Out of that side of that, futures up by 10 on the S&P. And gold, just a little nudge lower. Gold right now down a tenth of 1%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. With the First Word News, I'm Rishika Gupta. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell insists that businesses, schools and other organizations be protected against coronavirus lawsuits. And that's bogged down talks over a new stimulus package. McConnell is demanding that changes to liability law include be included in wholesale in the legislation. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says that that shows he's not serious about reaching a deal. Federal Reserve policymakers will turn their attention on how to jumpstart a stronger rebound from the recession. They're all but certain to keep their benchmark overnight rate unchanged when they wrap up their two-day meeting today. The Fed releases a statement at 2 p.m. New York time. Fed Chair Jerome Powell holds a news conference 30 minutes later. And Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos plans to tell Congress today that his company is an American success story with a relentless focus on customers. According to prepared testimony, the world's richest person will strike a patriotic tone for his appearance before the House Antitrust Subcommittee. Bezos will be joined by the CEOs of Facebook, Apple and Google parent Alphabet. And the UK is moving to snap up supplies of future coronavirus vaccines. It signed a deal with partners GlaxoSmithKline and Sanofi to obtain as many as 60 million doses of their experimental shot. The companies also are in talks to sell the vaccine to the US, the European Union and global organizations. In Hong Kong, the economy shrank for the fourth quarter in a row. The coronavirus pandemic and political unrest extended the city's first recession in a decade. Hong Kong's GDP fell a worse than expected 9% in the second quarter from a year ago. The unemployment rate has risen to a 15-year high. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
Boston Symphony Orchestra presents BSO at Home. While you stay inside, enjoy a curated collection of archived concerts and behind the scenes stories from BSO musicians. BSO Homeschool provides lessons for music lovers of all ages. New performances and messages from musicians are added regularly. Enjoy these selections and much more at bso.org slash at home. The national security bill was passed by Chinese lawmakers. The Hong Kong police force has already acted in accordance with the new law. It's a very disturbing development. This is, uh, in effect, an attempt to end one country, two systems. The central government is telling us, just stay out of politics. We've been working on the strategic future of the company. We're long past the stockpiling phase now in North America. And what we're seeing is big shifts uh, from category to category. So things like hand hygiene growing very quickly. It's a really a reminder, isn't it, just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade. We did see some pressure on the yuan. We did see some pressure on the futures. That is now being reversed. is really the only game in town at the moment. No one's really looking at the data. No one's necessarily talking about the election just yet. You know, we're all in an environment where not that many people are back in their offices, and yet the market's kind of just shrugging their shoulders and saying, well, the Fed's going to be there to backstop it. Nick Marusos there, Janice Henderson, Global Head of Global Bonds, the only game in town. Mohammed El, El Arian esque that was, Tom Keane. Alongside Lisa Bramis as well, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Ahead of the market open, equity futures up by around about a tenth of 1% on the S&P nice 500. A little bit of a lift. Rather, uh, we're up 12 points, Tom. Let me correct myself, up four tenths of 1%. Euro dollar one seventeen twenty six in a 10-year. In the bond market, 0.58% is your yield. We've been downplaying gear almost worldwide ahead of the Fed a little bit later. Tom, I think it's really interesting what Chairman Powell's going to have to say in this news conference ahead of expectations in September that they'll have to formalize forward guidance. Maybe also expectations to the next 24 hours and jobless claims as well. Linking in labor to what we're going to see in the Fed ballet today, Tom Purcelli, RBC Capital Markets. Tom, you do brilliant work on wage dynamics. What do you see right now and what do you see forward? You know, what, one of the interesting things I, I think that is probably underappreciated is if you look at um, something like wages and salaries, right, from the personal income and spending report, um, you know, you would think um, that, you know, obviously just looking at those in isolation, uh, they, they've fallen, right, and they've fallen pretty dramatically, about about 10% from the pre-COVID level. But when you add back in um, unemployment insurance, again, also from the, uh, the, the, pay, um, the personal income and spending report, um, what, what you actually see is that um, wages right now are about 5% above where they were during the pre-COVID period. So um, it, there's been a significant amount of backfill um, from, a, uh, from a, a sort of a lost wage perspective. You know, the reality is most of that has actually been saved, or at least a good portion of it has been saved. And, and of course, you can see that quite clearly in, in, in the incredibly elevated um, savings rate. But there's, there's a lot of ammunition out there. Um, but I, I think, you know, until people really start to feel very comfortable about where we are, um, from a COVID perspective, I, I think it probably winds up sitting uh, in, in savings at this point. Tom, how do you expect the chairman to navigate the fiscal question in the news conference? Yeah, you know, look, I, I think he's he's done a pretty good job of, of treading pretty carefully. I mean, uh, you know, and that's been true for the last several Fed, Fed chairs. You know, they just really haven't inserted themselves, um, uh, you know, that dramatically um, uh, into the fiscal conversation. Although you can say, you know, relative to, to prior chairman, uh, chair folks, uh, that they actually um, they are much more uh, inserted than, than than historically speaking. But we think that that Powell will continue to sort of you know um, uh, tread very carefully, not really insert himself too much into sort of driving home that they're supposed to be doing X, Y, or Z. But but acknowledging that um, help on that front is necessary. And look, the reality is that's that's exactly where we are. Um, you know, we continue to see um, fiscal stimulus uh, as a reality. Uh, we don't think that this is the last program. Uh, we think that there could easily be another one before the end of the year. Priya also, Priya Misra was talking about how another aspect of Chair Powell's testimony today may be with respect to market functioning and how QE has traditionally been used in order to smooth out the kinks in the market. That clearly is not a problem anymore based on where borrowing costs are. When did that become a fallacy based on your experience at the New York Fed? 
Well, sorry, what, how do you mean a fallacy? In, in the what sense way? that it's not anymore about market functioning, the bond purchases. Now we're talking about suppressing borrowing costs. We're talking about lowering rates in order to encourage risk-taking appetite. Yeah, look, I mean, I think that, 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 you know, the Fed has actually been pretty clear about this, right? It's, you know, QE is now officially a part of the, the, the toolkit. I mean, it was funny that they sort of acknowledged that only recently. Um, but I think that's uh, I think that's a reality. I, I don't think that goes away. I think that's going to remain part of, of the backdrop for the foreseeable future. Um, I, I think that, you know, sort of that naturally then begs the question, well, you know, what, what are they going to need to do beyond that? Um, which is a conversation we should probably have. But I think that, that QE... Um, in, in, in his current form, it's, it, 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 that's it, this is it. I mean, this is, it, it, it's, it's the, the equivalent of, in terms of usage, um, of Fed funds. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's now a standard part of the toolkit. So I, I, I think that, I don't know if there was ever a fallacy associated with what it was a, 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 a trying to do. I think it was always pretty clear from our perspective. Um, but I think that the Fed is now acknowledging that it's 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 a standard yeah, part of the toolkit. I, I think that that's um, they're just stating the obvious. Tom, to go back to my original idea here, and if, if we get your unemployment rate to go to wherever you've got it, eight, nine, ten, yeah. maybe even down to six percent unemployment, yeah. does that dampen wage growth, salary growth, benefit growth in America? Well, you know, we do think that it, the unemployment rate is going to remain uh, relatively elevated. Uh, I mean, I, I think by the end of the year, you know, we sort of think you'll be lucky if you get down to around 8% by the end of the year. So we do think that there's some dampening effect, obviously. So um, what does wages on, do? On, on I mean, uh, do, we do, do we end up with Clement Attlee England or do we end up with something a little more robust because of all the stimulus? Yeah, I, so I, I think you have to disentangle these ideas because I, I don't think you necessarily need wage pressures to see, you know, sort of a, a robust outcome from a growth perspective because of all of the stimulus that's in place, right? So, you know, one of the things that we've been sort of fond of highlighting to people is if you just look at the level of saving prior to um, prior to COVID, um, you know, saving uh, seasonally adjusted, obviously, et, et cetera, um, we were running at an um, annual rate. We were running at around a, a, tr a trillion bucks, right? That's where that's where savings was in the quarter prior to COVID-19. Um, if you look at the level of saving today, it's about six times higher. I mean, think think about that. It's six times higher. That's obviously the effect of stimulus. So what you can actually then uh, lay claim to is this idea that there is, um, uh, you know, quite a bit of ammunition that the consumer can unload and thus be able to sort of propel economic activity in a really robust way. So, so let me just define that a little bit because I think it's a really interesting part of the conversation. One of the things that we had been saying about Q3 is that you were going to see a pretty uh, rock solid bounce back. In fact, we still expect that. If you actually just see, um, if you see consumption grow at a 0.0% pace for the three months, consecutive months in um, the third quarter, you'd still see about a 30% increase in consumption. That's how much higher the June level was relative to the early part of the second quarter level. So there's there, so you're already starting at a very high base from a, a growth perspective. But if you throw in the idea that the consumer actually unloads some of that yeah. uh, stimulus, right, some of that savings, we were talking about looking at a, a cartoonishly high Q3. I mean, you could have seen a plus 100% Q3. Now, let me be clear, that is not going to happen now. Um, uh, you know, I think the sort of the, 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 the very one-sided conversation about the rise in case counts, I think, has really quelled any of that um, um, idea that you could see this, this enormous burst higher. But that's what you would have been staring at. And again, just to wrap the, the, the whole idea around your original question, please that has nothing to do with these sort of organic wage pressures. That's fiscal stimulus. Tom, I'm pleased you cleared that up at the end because you know people would have written the story that Tom Porcelli is looking for 100% GDP growth. In Q3. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Tom, great no, to catch up with you, sir. <laughs> Tom Porcelli, happen, right? OEC Capital we, we, Markets, we'll... Chief US Economist. Tom Keane, we wish. Tom Porcelli kept going back to that point, Tom. I think it's interesting. The amount of savings on the sidelines. Yeah. What's the catalyst to get that to snap back I, into consumption, spending? Uh, you know, you, you got the Washington Derby, John. You've got, you know, the Tech Derby, the Fed meeting, and you've got the stimulus. I thought Mike Allen at Axios just nailed it. The separation in America right now, John, of the haves and the have-nots in terms of comfort within this pandemic is just historic. We've never seen agree more. like this. Well said, Tom. Coming up on this program, Megan Green, Harvard Kennedy School senior fellow. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
voit la mort de George Floyd, on, on image la mort de mon petit frère Adama Traoré. Et la France va dénoncer tout de suite ce qui va se passer aux états unis Nous, dans le combat vérité et justice pour Adama, vraiment dans, dans le court terme, ce qu'on attend et ce qu'on exige surtout, c'est la mise en examen des gendarmes, la condamnation des gendarmes et d'un procès public. Aujourd'hui, on dénonce le déni de justice qui est en France depuis 4 ans. We took you inside the political turmoil gripping Hong Kong. This year, Beijing tightened its position with a new national security law. Will this jeopardize Hong Kong's position as a global financial center? And will China face the consequences from abroad? I'm Stephen Engel. We take a second look at the crisis facing the city in a Bloomberg television special, Hong Kong on Edge 2. New York City, this is Bloomberg Surveillance for our audience worldwide. We're live on Bloomberg TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. 60 minutes from the cash open. Here's the price action in the equity market. Futures drifting higher, as Tom pointed out. Just a little bit of a lift in the last 20 minutes. Up a third of 1% on the S&P. There's your euro move, settling down and settling in around 117 at 117.29. Treasuries unchanged going into the Fed. 24 hours from now, Tom Keane. We'll have jobless claims in America. <coughs> the estimate right yep. now, 1.43 million. That's a little bit of a lift on the previous week. And let's be clear, we've stalled. The improvement just isn't there, Tom, in the last couple of weeks. And for many people, that's a concern. The single message I've read, I heard it from High Frequency Economics Publishing this morning, John. I heard it from J.P. Morgan this weekend. High frequency data really, really, really matters right now. And I totally agree with you. Claims tomorrow at 8.30 is a huge deal. Someone taking market economics and folding it into the academic space is Megan Green, now at Harvard's Kennedy School, but with some real street cred and street experience as well. She joins us right now. Megan, your Twitter feed is great. And you have a spectacular retweet from New York Magazine of evictions and of rents to be paid August 1st. How much are the elite in Washington missing the tangible reality that X percent of America can't make the rent August 1st? So I think they're missing it both in terms of eviction protections, which obviously need to be extended, but also in terms of uh, extending enhanced unemployment benefits, which, you know, as you know, the Republicans are still fighting about within themselves, let alone between the Republicans and the Democrats. So I do think that the the point that actually there is this cash cliff, a severe cash cliff for a lot of people on the ground, um, is getting caught up in party politics. Our last conversation, we talked about the buildup in savings rate. So that's the haves. That's the fancy people, Megan, building up their savings right now. Do you have any estimate of what portion of America is struggling right now? 
Uh, so it's impossible to come up with that number because it's such a granular question. Um, but certainly look at that statistic that you cited, you know, 25% of people aren't making their rent payments in New York City, haven't done since March. It's a huge percentage of just one city. So scale that up across the economy. It's, it's a lot of people. And, and so this question on, you know, should we give people $600 a week or $200 a week? Uh, I think, you know, the answer is go bigger than smaller because consumption is the biggest piece of GDP. And, you know, I think we'll see later this week that that will have fallen off a cliff in Q2. When we talk about employment, Tom's done a really good job of talking about the haves and the have-nots this morning, especially ahead of this Fed meeting. Your next column, I think I can read the title uh, on air. It is why we create so many craft jobs in the U.S. and what we can do about it. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by that? Are we seeing that even now in the pandemic, that on the other side of this, you expect the craft jobs, to quote you, as being the ones that get most traction heading out of this rather than the better, higher-paying jobs? Yeah, so that's not an official title for what it's worth. But by crap jobs, I just mean low-wage, low-hour jobs. So it's not a, a judgment that I'm making, but it's, it's the quality of jobs in terms of pay, um, in terms of people being able to make ends meet. And so over you know the past decade and even longer, we've increasingly shifted towards low-wage, low-hour jobs that we're creating. Um, and we need to figure out how to upgrade those jobs so that they're high-wage, high-hour jobs. And on top of that, we need to figure out how we can go ahead and create new jobs that are already high hour, high wage jobs so that people can make ends meet. So we don't end up having these hourly service workers hit so incredibly hard in the face of a crisis like this. And it's going to be really difficult, but I think now is the moment that we need to be thinking about it, particularly in the run up to an election. We need to think about unionization, things like market concentration, and in terms of creating right. high wage, high hour jobs, you know, retooling the economy for sustainability and climate change is an absolute no brainer. It was a no brainer right. before this crisis. Now it's even more so. I mean, John, I've been here early morning. I know you slide in at 6.52 to get ready for Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. But John, what Megan just said there is exactly what Al Broadus said. Even the conservative framework of an Al Broadus is saying, Put the stimulus on right now. Even the conservative economists are saying, don't let up on the stimulus. Tom, continuing claims tomorrow, set to climb, still in and around 16 million. That's going to be a concern if that's the number. Megan Green, if you went to one of those fancy testimonies down on Capitol Hill, maybe socially distanced, maybe virtually, and there was a conversation about this $600 enhanced unemployment benefit, disincentivizing people going back to work, holding back labor supply, what would you say to them? Uh, there's no evidence for that at all. Um, I don't think that's the case. Uh, and, you know, I don't think the numbers play that out. Um, and furthermore, you know, we have had a bounce back in jobs, but that's largely because the PPP loans did what they were meant to do and lots of people rehired. Um, but it's not like there are all these new jobs being created. Businesses are expanding or starting up right now. So, you know, I think people, if they could find jobs, they would be. They're certainly not hanging out on unemployment, which is about, you know, which has expired and, and may not be re-upped um, instead of going out and getting jobs. So I just think that's completely 100% um, wrong. So, Megan, given where we are at the moment, with this recovery stalling, plateauing, flattening out, in the way that many people anticipated deeper into the summer, you went from shutdown to reopen, got that initial jump, and then you flattened out. What's the optimal policy response? What would you suggest? Uh, so I think in terms of fiscal policy, you know, re-upping a lot of what has already been done, considering that we're still digging out of a hole, we're not actually providing stimulus, we're still stemming the downside, that's important, but most important of all is the virus. And until we can actually contain that, until we come up with treatments or a vaccine, there will be no economic recovery really to speak of. And so confidence is key, and we won't have that return until we do manage to get the virus contained. And so that's not a question of just a quick stimulus, unless it's money to health care and health policy. Uh, it's more a question about, you know, social distancing and locking people down and addressing new cases as they spike. Later today, Megan, uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell is expected to come out with a really accommodative stance. Perhaps he'll talk about the stimulus going on in Washington, D.C. At this point, do you think that a more accommodative Federal Reserve is more helpful or more hurtful in taking pressure off Washington for a fiscal stimulus, which is arguably what's more needed to get the economy back up in speed? So, 
neither, honestly. I think the Fed has pretty much done its job. It's gotten rid of the dislocations in the markets, and it's uh, gotten borrowing costs to incredibly low levels. And so there really isn't much more that the Fed can do right now other than to sort of try to goad Congress into doing their job and passing some kind of fiscal stimulus. So I don't think there's a huge moral hazard at this point in terms of the Fed having done the heavy <coughs> lifting and so Congress not worrying about it. Um, I do think Congress knows they need to pass okay. another fiscal stimulus bill. So I, I don't think that the Fed can really hurt or help at the moment. You They're know, sort of stuck where they are. And Megan, we've had like eight conversations on this today. The moral hazard is the massive financial repression that we have off the nominal yield in this country. I mean, we've destroyed the concept of saving. We've made dividend growth the new 10-year yield. This isn't normal, is it? How do we ex extricate ourselves from this massive negative real yields in a, in a near zero nominal yield? Yeah, so that's already happened. I mean, that's been the case for a while now. That's not down to today's meeting. Um, but I think the answer is we don't extricate ourselves from this for a while. I think borrowing costs need to remain really low given the economic crisis that we're facing. So I think we're stuck in this for a really long time until we see unemployment come down. And by the way, I wouldn't be surprised if unemployment ticked up in the July non-farm payrolls report rather than coming wow. down further. Um, and, and until we see inflation, which again, I don't think we're going to see for a really long time. We might see some, but um, not significantly above the Fed's target. And so I think the Fed is kind of stuck where they are for a while. Megan, quick lesson with you. I'll be the student, of course. You're the professor. The experience of Japan and Europe and negative interest rates. Tom Porcelli of RBC was on a program talking about this huge amount of serving, savings in America. If we went to negative at the Federal Reserve somehow and had negative deposit rates in America and many of these checking accounts, would people save more or spend more? So first, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think we'll have negative policy rates in the U.S. Uh, for a number of reasons. But there's very little evidence in Europe and Japan that negative rates have actually pushed people to spend. So I think we could end up with an increase in savings, and that just exacerbates the savings that we already have globally. Um, and that makes things like secular stagnation uh, even more here to stay than it already is. And, and we'll keep rates and inflation and growth low for a long time. So I think it will cause people to save, but I don't think we're going to have that policy move. Megan, great to catch up with you. Megan Green there, Harvard Kennedy School Senior Fellow. And Tom, isn't that the issue for Europe, Japan, and the United States as well? The negative rates in Europe in Japan haven't led to the um, outcomes people desired. I remember President Draghi saying they went to negative rates in the summer of 2014. And President Draghi started talking about we need to be low now to be higher in the future. Rates have gone lower since then, Tom, not higher. I, uh, it's, a, it's a longer question, John, than we have right now. But, you know, what I would really suggest is everybody listen to David Folkert's land out Deutsche Bank. A, it's not in the textbooks. It's been made up. It's an experiment, and it's ongoing, and the profound effect on incentives is unmeasurable right now. The pressure on these central banks will increase with this economy set to roll over a little bit. You heard Megan Green looking for a negative print, perhaps, but a higher unemployment rate, yeah. possibly, yeah. as well. Lisa, the headlines about the layoffs have been building over the last couple of weeks. Going back to Airbus a number of weeks ago, we're seeing more evidence of that this morning. Yeah, Boeing coming out after earnings and saying they're going to cut more jobs, and this is in addition to the 10 percent workforce reduction they now earlier and this comes as they're slowing production because people just are not flying they're not uh, they're not buying planes at the big airlines and John this sort of goes to the heart of the deflationary feel here what can the Fed do to really get this up and going if people aren't going out and yeah Lisa thanks Tom it's the phrase we hate you and I both Lisa too right size I can't yeah. stand it but this is the right size side of things these businesses look around look at the economy understand it's not getting back to normal anytime soon and they quote right right size the business revenues, it means layoffs. revenues are units and price i've never seen the unit declines that we see right now i don't believe i was living the depression john a uh, ge today went right through their operating groups and the unit decline uh, that they had was shocking i mean this is it's a cliche it is new territory oh some of it's utterly depressing coming up <clears throat> this one might depress be depressing as well capitol hill for the fiscal talks a little bit later, and the tech hearings as well. That's where the focus is today. And then, a little bit later, 2 p.m. Eastern, Fed coverage right here on Bloomberg TV and radio. Coming up next on Gold, Dennis Gartman, the retired editor of the Gartman Letter from New York. This is Bloomberg. 
With the first word news, I'm Ritika Gupta. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has drawn a line in the sand on a new stimulus package. He's insisting that his proposed changes to liability law be included wholesale in the legislation. That's bogged down talks between President Trump's representatives and the Democrats. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says it shows McConnell's not serious about reaching a deal. Mixed news on the coronavirus pandemic front in the U.S. Florida reported a record number of deaths, but new infections slowed down in two states grappling with outbreaks, California and Arizona, and the positive test rate in Texas fell to the lowest in a month. Mixed news on the coronavirus pandemic nominee next week, and he told reporters he'll let them know as soon as he does. The Democratic presidential nominee has pledged to pick a woman running mate. Last week, Biden said the group of candidates includes four black women, amongst others. And Visa is starting to benefit from the slow reopening of American cities, but the credit card network isn't willing to predict what the next two months will bring. Visa says spending rose almost 10% in recent weeks. Still, that wasn't enough for the company to offer guidance for its four-year performance. In Hong Kong, the economy shrank for the fourth quarter in a row. The coronavirus pandemic and political unrest extended the city's first recession in a decade. Hong Kong's GDP fell a worse than expected 9% in the second quarter from a year ago. The unemployment rate has risen to a 15-year high. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Support is working every day to keep essential market data flowing seamlessly. We keep on so you can keep on. When opportunity knocks at the door, don't say, Blimey, I've still got my pajamas on. To say yes to stuff and it will take you into some places. We're clearly going through some very unusual times uh, and, you know, e enormous uh, difficulties uh, getting groups of people to agree on things. From Bloomberg's European headquarters in the city of London, join us on Leaders with LACWA. up to do on that front so we are expecting to see a little bit of strength coming through at the start of trade how long will it last though yeah, the perennial question some things you see coming some things you don't the trick is to be ready for anything john from infrastructure support is working every day to keep essential market data flowing seamlessly
fees that retailers have to pay um, to be able to enter the markets, the democratization of the markets by allowing them to have direct access to the markets over the last 10 to 20 years has really been you know, a key trend that has driven, I would say, the U.S. markets. that we're, we're cautious on the market and, and the S&P 500 overall um, in terms of not really expecting more, more upside through year end is that we, we expect there could be payback risk from all the stimulus we've seen and that a lot of the, the biggest stimulus has largely been, been behind us. Jill Kerry Hall there of Bank of America on a stimulus behind us and a stimulus in front of us as well. A little bit later, I'll be catching up with Samantha Azzarello of J.P. Morgan Investment Management. Looking to, forward to doing that on Bloomberg TV a little bit later on, Tom. You have got an important guest, though, Tom. This, this is, is Dennis, Garman, uh, Dennis Garman out of retirement off the golf course. And, John, this is without question the most important conversation in gold in the week, the month, and indeed the quarter. This is like equivalent to Gary Schilling on low interest rates, a major uh, shout out to the bulls in the equity market, someone like Ben Laidler uh, at Tower Hudson. Gartman nailed gold. He went even further and said, not only own gold, but own it in yen and euro. And we get an update this morning from Mr. Gartman. Dennis, I believe off your reports, you are out of gold. How could yeah. Gartman be out of gold? Well, let's, let's, I'm practicing social distancing in the gold market. Uh, it has become a little too crowded, and as uh, I think it was Yogi Berra who's, who was talking about a restaurant one time in New York who said nobody goes there anymore, it's too crowded. It's become awfully crowded. The boat has become very crowded, too many people involved. I couldn't get people interested in gold uh, of consequence two and three years ago, and now it's front page well, news. Now it's the front page of every report that you see. It's the front page of magazines. It's the lead article on, and, and the radio and television. And I think it's just become a bit too crowded. That's all. How much of a pullback do you need to see to become enthusiastic again? Well, first of all, there are, uh, let's say that I've always told people in a bull market there are three positions one can have, really long, modestly long, or neutral. And at this point on gold, I'm neutral. How far down do I think I need to see it go? Well, we we're trading close to 1900, 1955, I think, just a few seconds ago. Uh, if we traded back to 1775 to 18 mm -hmm. and a quarter, mm -hmm. I'd be a buyer. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And do I think that we'll get that kind of correction? Yes, I think we will. Do I, can I tell where, if it gets to 1775? Is that reasonable? I'll just simply say $100 from, from any interim high, and I'm a buyer again. What's the catalyst for a sell-off? Just the fact that the, the market is way too crowded, too many people involved, nothing more than that. Sometimes that's all one needs. You might see uh, a, a Fed become less accommodative, discussing perhaps a, a, a less expansionary policy towards its balance sheet. Some sort of comment from a Federal Reserve official might do it. Uh, a, a turnaround in the dollar to a stronger dollar, which I don't think is going to happen, that might do it. A weakness in the stock market, that might do it. There's a number of things, but let's just simply say too many people are all, all of a sudden all involved in the, in the gold market. There's only one position that everybody has that's long, and I think that's just people have to be taken out of that trade. Dennis, Nothing weakness in the stock market causing a sell-off in gold. Does this mean that the correlation between gold and a risk-off feel in markets is broken? Well, it, it's interesting. Sometimes gold and stocks go up together. Sometimes gold and stocks go in contravention one to another. For the past several months, they've been moving in, in convention one with the other. As gold has gone up, so has stocks. As stocks has gone up, have gone up, so has gold. But I do think that there's a great probability that that <coughs> conventional movement, that that consistency yeah. between the two shall, shall continue for a while longer. So if, if the stock market, and I think stocks are extremely expensive, if stocks start to tumble, you'll get a, mm -hmm. a, a correlative sell-off in the gold market. Yeah, what people don't understand, folks, is the Dennis Garman newsletter was 10, 12, 14 pages long each day, and the back three or four pages were on the political philosophy of this nation. Dennis, I know there's going to be four hipsters in front of Congress today. Rumor <laughs> has it you are going to be the fifth horseman, <laughs> and you're not there. But what is Congress doing going after the value-add capitalism that we've seen out of silicon technology? It's ill-advised. It's a bad decision, but they're going to do it anyway because that's the left-wing phenomenon. That's the left-wing philosophy that seems to dominate the news media at this point. So it's going to be, I think it'll, it'll be <coughs> terribly ugly. 
ugly, uh, almost as ugly as what we watched yesterday with the attacks upon Mr. Barr. So this, I don't think, is going to be a very pretty day for the to be a. How should they handle it? How should you I mean? You and I remember the Bloomberg headline where the Justice Department walked away from the Microsoft litigation of years ago, AT and T, etc. What's your advice to these guys, over lobbied, over expert, about how to patiently get through this? That's exactly what they should do. Patiently get through it. Try not to smirk. Try not to laugh. Try not to get up and walk out. Answer the questions with yes and no answers and be as genteel and as southern as you possibly can be. It'll be very difficult. Genteel and southern. Well, you own that, Dennis. Dennis, I want to go back to the equity markets where Lisa was uh, before. You say they're overpriced, but they have yeah. a bid. I have to participate <laughs> in a 401k. I'm not trading like Doug Cass or you or, <clears throat> you know, the day traders. I know you're on the couch. Mrs. Garbin's on the couch doing the Robin Hood thing. If I'm in a 401k, I have to participate. How do I do that? Well, I think you should still be. It, it is still a bull market, and it's still a long-term bet on the benefits and, and the, the attributes of the American system. Over long periods of time, it'll still be. Th five years from now, stocks will be from the lower left to the upper right from where they are now. Shall they be from the lower left to the upper right in the next six months? I have my doubts. And if you're, long, uh, if you're overly exposed, I think being somewhat less exposed after a 37 or 38 percent rally in the NASDAQ in the mm -hmm. course of the last three months probably makes sense to take some of that off the table. Raise a little cash. Right. Can't hurt you at all. Dennis, Lisa emails in from surveillance and says, when you get a chance, Dennis, tell us when to go long gold again. Mr. Gartman, just brilliant on the moonshot that we've seen on gold in yen and in euro uh, as well. Futures up 9, Dow futures up 41. Uh, Lisa, you know, it's, it's just amazing there how you have a call or a belief and then you have to wait for it to occur. Most people don't have that patience. You know, the whole idea of a crowded trade is by design right now. The Fed has created a crowded trade. I'm just yes. wondering, Tom, at what point do you fight the Fed? Because essentially that's what you're doing <coughs> if you say that there is a crowded trade that you don't like. You're waiting for a mistake for basically people to realize that perhaps they have too much faith in the Fed, in fiscal support, and that could be a potential trigger. But otherwise, this flood of liquidity has suppressed borrowing costs so much that just the earnings yield, the dividends that you get on <coughs> stocks are starting to look good to a lot of investors. Yeah, I saw a yield on a blue chip today with 3.6%, which is lofty. You're absolutely right, Lisa, about you don't know how you get there. You make a call like Long Gold and Gartman and that. And, folks, you don't know the eight ways you get to that successful outcome. You never do. But there it is. And then you get, Lisa, as you mentioned, the crowded uh, trade, which certainly we see within the moonshot of gold uh, right now. I'm not giving an opinion on gold there. I know Lisa is, but I'm not. <laughs> you've got gold <coughs> bars in your bedroom. Yes, I know well, that you do. You've, I, I have oil. You've got gold bars. I got the Kruger Rands with Vet Bill under the dog couch. Um, what we've got today is an exceptionally busy day. We've got the Fed meeting at 2 o'clock. Thrilled to join Caroline Hyde for that with some really good guests involved. Uh, Scott Minard, I believe, will stop by. Before that, a double barrel 12 noon. We will have the tech hearings, and they will, of course, be extraordinary, and the introductions will be there. But while they're introducing the tech hearings, Lawrence Kopp will join us. He is with General Electric, and this is a really important conversation, much more than GE, because of his heritage at the Danaher Corporation. Lawrence Kopp on industrial America. That will be interesting. Again, futures up eight, Dow futures up 38 as well. Gold for Gartman, 1975, the ounce. This is Bloomberg. Good morning.
true diversification. That's what adding commodities exposure to your stock and bond portfolio can help provide. The Bloomberg Commodity Index is the standard for commodity market exposure. 23 traded commodities are represented. Agriculture, livestock, metals, and energy. The Bloomberg Commodity Index is the benchmark most widely used by investment professionals globally. Track your commodity investments with a proven financial information partner. The Bloomberg Commodity Index. True diversification. I am David Weston. Bloomberg Television is reinventing one of the most iconic brands in financial television for a new audience. Join me to see the news program for the clever investor. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. viewers worldwide good morning good morning the countdown to the open starts right now with 30 minutes until the opening bell equity futures positive a third of one percent on the s p 500 what a day we've got coming up on capitol hill with tech hearings and the fiscal debates continuing top of the pile though for me fed chair jay powell facing off in a news conference and we're looking for him to build on the words of governor brainard the shift from stabilization to accommodation Looking ahead, it likely will be appropriate to shift the focus of monetary policy from stabilization to accommodation by supporting a full recovery in employment and a sustained return of inflation to its 2% objective. Governor Brainard there really planting a seed that a lot of people are trying to work out what it means for the coming meetings. Let's begin the program with Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. Hey, Mike. Yeah, John, uh, a lot of people divided over what Governor Brainard meant and when that would happen. The general consensus is maybe not at this meeting, recognizing in their statement today that the economy has deteriorated in the past month, prepare markets for a change in September uh, when they offer new forecasts on unemployment, growth, inflation, and rates. But for right now, it doesn't seem to be a necessarily a need to do that. We know they're going to keep policy low for years. The dot plot last time suggested 2022. You look at that there, the financial conditions index. Financial conditions just keep getting looser. Another move lower this week. And so there's no reason to go into QE or to uh, utilize something like yield curve control. Market rates aren't rising. They're actually falling a little bit. Spreads remain compressed, so the accommodation part is there right now. Now, the Fed could provide a little more accommodation. You take a look at the yield curve, and obviously it's steepened in recent months, and they could bring down the medium to long end if they want to with additional QE purchases, but the gain for the economy isn't exactly clear because mortgage rates, you look at it, they're already at record lows. Uh, Powell might start to uh, set the stage for a change in the, the Fed's policies by talking about their uh, financial uh, review that they've been doing for the last year, the year-long review on monetary policy, uh, uh, possibly uh, going to a statement that puts a 2% target for inflation or an unemployment goal in as the way they uh, utilize forward guidance. The danger in that, of course, is, and this is being talked about in the markets, the uh, idea that inflation could get out of control. Some people remember the 70s, and even before that, uh, the dollar has started to fall, giving some people concern about where the Fed might be going. So. The best guess today is you get a new statement language expressing concern about the direction of the economy and considerable risks that remain out there. Reiteration of their promise to keep buying treasuries and MBS at the current pace, about $80 billion for treasuries, $40 billion a month for MBS. Hints about a change in forward guidance. And then uh, we expect Jay Powell to once again make the case for additional fiscal help, perhaps leaning on the idea that this really hurts minorities and the poor. 
And uh, he may not say exactly what they want, but he's probably going to emphasize the need for additional help that doesn't come from the Fed. Mike, state contingent forward guidance has been a huge conversation. Introduced back in December 2012, the threshold was 6.5 percent for unemployment. Given what they've learned in the last 10 years, if they go forward with this in the coming meetings, do you expect that point to be a whole lot lower? Significantly lower. Some Fed officials have talked about 4% as a uh, guidance level, and others say maybe we can even suggest going beyond that. Remember, we got to 3.5% before the COVID crisis hit. So yes, the Fed believes that the, the Nehru, uh, the inflation rate, uh, the, the unemployment rate when inflation goes up is significantly lower than it was. Mike McKee there on the latest with the Fed. Looking forward to that news conference. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research joining us now. Not expecting any major announcements on rates or curve control, but writing the following. They may offer hints or a framework on forward guidance, but they're under no pressure to change it at this meeting. Jim joins us now. Jim, that shift from stabilization to accommodation, what does it mean to you, sir? It means that the Fed is going to stay market friendly for a lot longer. They are going to continue to keep rates low. Well, they've already told us they're going to do that for years. They're going to continue to buy securities. Uh, they're buying treasuries in the trillions with a T, and they're buying um, corporate bonds and ETFs and loans in the hundreds of billions, and that shouldn't change anytime soon. So I don't expect them to give us any indication that there's going to be a change on that, at least now. No yield curve control. They'll talk probably about forward guidance, but I don't think we're going to get some kind of main and major announcement on what that's going to mean just yet. Jim, there's clearly been a shift in the reaction function over the last 12, 18 months, the shift towards tolerating higher inflation, given the conditioning of the last 10 years with the inflation story and the labor market as well. How do you expect them to formalize that shift in the reaction function in the coming meetings? You're right. There has been a shift towards tolerating more inflation, but they haven't had any more inflation to actually tolerate. They'll use some high flutin language like talking about average interest rate targeting or AIT, which means they have a target of 2%. That'll be an average over a long period of time. So if the inflation rate runs above 2%, and I'll again remind you it hasn't in at least the last eight years, then they'll tolerate that as long as a long-term average is around 2%. All of that, though, is contingent on the market. If the market is okay with the inflation rate running above 2%, so is the Fed. If the inflation rate goes above 2% and the bond market sells off hard on that news, then the Fed will be forced to change. Jim, this is what's interesting about this moment. Just because they might say we'll tolerate higher inflation does not mean we will get higher inflation. From the bond market perspective, how do you push that view through Treasuries? Yeah, you know, it's going to be real hard to kind of look at the bond market as a measure of the economy because the Fed seems to be targeting it, to quote the great Charles Goodhart, an economist in Oxford, uh, that a measure cannot, once you make turn it into a target, it can't be a measure anymore. So the bond market, I think, is going to continue to react to the idea of stimulus from the central bank. As long as they're in there buying and buying hard, you're going to continue to see rates hover sideways like they have even in the face of higher inflation. Only when inflation rises to the point where you get like this universal idea in the bond market that it should be avoided, bonds should be avoided because inflation is going up, could the sell-off overwhelm the central bank? But we're nowhere near that right now. So I suspect rates will continue to stay lower and continue to grind sideways. And I would caution anybody from reading too much into that about the state of the economy. Yeah, Jim, let's talk about the margins we're talking about here. The inflation target at the moment in and around 2%. If they shift to average inflation targeting, what's the effective target? 2.5%, 50 basis points higher, at a push 100. It's not a massive move, is it? No, it's not. In other words, you're right, that they would, they would allow the inflation rate to go up and stay around 2.5% or so. I might add, the last time it was there, was almost 30 years ago. I mean, it's hard to believe that we haven't had 2.5%, I'm talking about core inflation now, yeah. for almost 30 years. So, yeah, they could you know, continue to talk about that, and I could continue to pretend that I can high jump eight feet, too, as well. But, you know, first we actually have to see that target before we actually start talking about whether or not it's meaningful. So if they say they'll tolerate something that they can't do or haven't seen in 30 years, that's nice, but let's see it actually un unfold in the first place. Jim, how do you expect the chairman to navigate the fiscal issues in the news conference? 
you know, he'll he'll talk about the need to continue to stimulate the economy. I think he'll try and avoid the question, especially now at this juncture. The Republicans are not in agreement. They're fighting among themselves. They're fighting with the Democrats. No one quite knows what they want to do. And the last thing they need is for the chairman to kind of get in the middle of that fracas. So I suspect he'll try and talk about, you know, the overarching theme that it's important to stimulate the economy. We need something, but be very short on specifics of what that something is. Do you think the data will do the hard work for them tomorrow to focus the minds of policymakers down in Washington? I'm just looking at initial jobless claims that are due out tomorrow. Jim, the estimate is for continuing claims to pop higher again, just a little bit, and stop that improvement. Are you concerned about the direction of travel at the moment? Yes, I am very concerned about it, because if you look at the high-frequency data, not only claims, they've been trending higher, but mobility, gasoline demand, restaurant bookings, hours work, they're all trending in the wrong direction. Not meaning that the economy is turning south, more that it has kind of stalled its recovery. We're not back close to any pre-pandemic levels, and we're now starting to stall. And I suspect you're going to get more of that with tomorrow's claims number. And that I don't know if that'll be enough to add fuel to the fire immediately, but over the next several weeks, you should probably continue to see more sluggish data. Jim, great to catch up with you, sir. Jim Bianco there of Bianco Research. Looking forward to that claims number tomorrow. I'm not looking forward to it personally. Just 24 hours out. 1.43 million is the median estimate right now. A little bit later, special coverage of the Fed beginning at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Coming up next on this program, stimulus negotiations continuing on Capitol Hill. We'll be speaking to Tony Rodriguez, Nuveen's head of fixed income strategy. That's next from New York, 20 minutes out from the opening bell. With equity futures in positive territory, this is Bloomberg. weekly review of the most important business news analysis and interviews from Bloomberg Television around the world. Ken Burns, welcome to Bloomberg Big Decisions. We have always been a mixture of things. We are always stronger for that mixture. Growth is a way to stay competitive, delight more and more consumers. Welcome to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. They've moved the needle by acknowledging that they have to monitor the content. What is one word of advice you'll take with you? Learn how to listen. And that is certainly something that has served me well. Ankiti, where do you go from here? It's a huge market. It's a huge opportunity. I want to go 100x from here. Our philosophy is to partner where we can and stand apart when we should a sense of the real-time action. The 10-year yield tumbling now 11 basis points, so continuing in this knee-jerk risk-off field. The Boston Symphony Orchestra presents BSO at Home, a collection of concerts, at-home lessons, and behind-the-scenes stories to enjoy while you stay at home. Learn more at bso.org slash at home. and uh, we'll be talking about it. There are, you know, also things that I very much support, um, but we'll be negotiating. It's sort of semi-irrelevant because the Democrats come with their needs and asks and the Republicans go with theirs. So we'll be discussing it with uh, Mitch and all of the other people involved. 
President Donald Trump weighing in on fiscal talks. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell drawing a hard line on liability insurance, saying, quote, no bill will pass the Senate that doesn't have the liability protection in it. The Democrats need to understand for the country to get back to normal. We cannot have an epidemic of lawsuits on the heels of the pandemic. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer saying Republicans need to get on the same page. Democrats in the House passed the HEROES Act two months ago, two and a half months ago. Instead of coming up with a single comprehensive bill, divisions within their own party forced Republicans to release several separate bills. With all their infighting, they can't even agree on one bill. Kevin already joins us right now, Bloomberg Chief Washington Correspondent. Kevin, the path forward this Wednesday, what is it? Well, two main divides right now as we dive into the weeds in terms of the negotiations between Speaker Pelosi and Republicans. Uh, the first is over the $600 supplemental for, unin for uh, unemployed benefits. That is something that is being perceived, I'm told, as a red line of sorts for the Democrats. But then the second issue, Jonathan, is on this issue pertaining to aid for state and local governments. Now, you'll remember that many Republican governors, including the likes of Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, have been pushing, along with Democrats, for there to be some adequate funds for state and local governments, simply because they might be running out of cash and have to be forced to have layoffs and furloughs by the end of the year. However, Democrats in their proposal have called for about $900 million worth of bailout money for state and local governments. That number is negotiable. So that's one of the, I think, sticking points right now that could dramatically shift and potentially have a breakthrough uh, in the coming days. Either way, from a political matter, Leader McConnell perceived by Democrats as being somewhat weakened in terms of his negotiation power because of the divide in the Republican caucus in the Senate. Well, Kevin, let's talk about that divide right now. This from Republican Senator Ben Sass. He said the following, the White House is trying to solve bad polling by agreeing to indefensibly bad debt. He went on to say this proposal is not targeted to fix precise problems. It's about Democrats and Trumpers competing to outspend each other. What do you do if you're Senator McConnell right now? Do you just you know, admit I that you've got to let these people go to try and make a deal with the Democrats? I think that could be one potential political path that he takes. I would also point that there was someone else in the room yesterday with Speaker Pelosi and Secretary Mnuchin, and that's Mark Meadows, the president's chief of staff, who previously had served in the House Freedom Caucus. He has deep ties to ultra-conservatives in the House Republican Conference, in the House of Representatives. So from a negotiating matter, he has the ear of his former House colleagues uh, and, and I think, you know, could be seen as a, as a potential... Uh, a political secret weapon of sorts to make a deal with some of those members. Kevin, before I let you go, just some breaking news in the last couple of minutes. Would love mm -hmm. a quick comment if I can, and I apologize for putting you on the spot. The U.S. to remove about 12,000 military troops from Germany. What's the strategy here, Kevin? So about 6,000 of those troops are being removed from Germany, and about 5,000 are going to be deployed to other countries. This was largely an expected move. It was forecasted by the former ambassador to Germ Germany, Richard Grinnell, uh, and of course now the Trump administration making do uh, with those insinuations. But this was something that had been forecasted. Uh, so that's from a foreign policy perspective. From a political perspective, this gives the president an opportunity to say on the campaign trail that he is withdrawing troops from overseas uh, at a time in which he had campaigned to do so several years ago. Hey, Kevin, brilliant. Across everything down in Washington, D.C. today. We appreciate it, Kevin. Thank you. Kevin Cerulli there, our chief Washington correspondent. Nubin's Tony Rodriguez expecting fiscal negotiations to go down to the wire. He writes the following. More fiscal and monetary stimulus will be required globally. Additional fiscal support in the U.S. is becoming highly politicized and an 11th hour compromise will be likely as the clock ticks down to the expiration of various first round stimulus programs. Tony joins us now. Tony, the confidence on Wall Street that DC will get this done. Why so confident? I think there's a lot of confidence primarily because we have an election coming up and we know that a lot of what this stimulus package is going to do is try to bridge the economy and therefore support constituents of people on both sides of the aisle. So you have this $600 stimulus going away. In addition to that, when you look at all the unemployment programs, there's about 30 million citizens receiving some sort of unemployment benefit. So that's a lot of votes, it's a lot of voters, and we think that that's probably the biggest driver behind why eventually, although it's gonna be ugly, um, they will come to an agreement on a package of which one of the key elements, as you were just speaking about, 
is this unemployment, supplemental unemployment insurance benefit. Tony, these issues are huge particularly for the people that make up these painful economic statistics at the moment, the expiration of the enhanced unemployment benefits, the protection around evictions, all expiring month end. But Tony, one thing that hasn't been talked about enough is state aid. And for people in the fixed income market right now, they're well aware what this could mean for state finances and the state level austerity we might see in the coming months as well. For you, from the fixed income perspective, Tony, what are you focused on? Well, you're absolutely right, John, and to focus on that. I mean, right now, across the country, state and local governments are suffering, obviously, a pretty significant hit to their revenues, whether it's sales taxes, real estate taxes, you name it, but also a big increase in expenses. So they cover the state unemployment benefits, and of course, there's significant other costs uh, that are pandemic-related as well. And when you look at state and local budgets, they, unlike the federal government, which can run pretty massive and is running a pretty massive deficit, they generally have uh, balanced budget laws, so they will have to respond quickly to that revenue and expense imbalance, and that means cutting costs, and that means cutting jobs. And so in terms of the potential for the recovery, that is one of the biggest hurdles in the face of this recovery, is that if the state and local government sector has to begin cutting jobs. So from a fixing up perspective, obviously that means that that can lead to a more risk-off environment than what we've been seeing for these last couple of months where the market is really focused more on the kind of risk-on elements of fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus that have been coming through into the market over the last couple of months. Tony, for Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who said or referenced suggested a couple of months ago to be a little bit more accurate that this was a blue state problem and he didn't want to bail out the blue states. Tony, is this just a blue state problem? Yeah, absolutely not the way we think about it at Nuveen. I mean, when you look at uh, the revenue hits, the expense increases, that is happening across the country. And initially, you might have said that the COVID crisis was more, it was impacting blue states a bit more. We've obviously seen over the last month and a half that as reopenings have been taking place, we're starting to see dramatic increases in a lot of the southern states, red states, Texas, Florida, et cetera. So, it clearly is not a blue-red divide in terms of the impact on state and local governments. And Tony, to be clear here, this isn't about political bias. You're putting money to work. And I just wonder, from your perspective, which states are vulnerable right now? Just thinking about municipal bonds at the moment, which states are vulnerable and which states are stronger, more resilient? Yeah, well, clearly you want states where they came into the crisis with a reasonably, you know, solid fiscal footing. So those are, those are in good shape. You also wanted states where there was kind of economic activity that was improving, uh, and that meant both southern red states, let's call it, and coastal uh, blue states as well. But what's really happening now is that you're wanting to uh, focus on ones where you feel like they have a reasonably effective approach to managing the virus. And that is certainly something that's landing on states' laps because they're not getting the kind of uh, direction, support, leadership that you might, you might have thought would, uh, would be there from a federal level. Tony, just help me frame this appropriately. Do you think from the perspective of forced defaults or forced austerity for some of these states at the moment and the problems on the horizon that you think they face? I, we don't see a 20, you know, 2020, 2021 significant forced defaults at all. But what we do see is austerity measures, which certainly hurt economic activity, both the state economic activity and the broader U.S. market. So we don't expect it to be a near-term 12, 18 months significant increase in defaults, but we do think that it causes, again, it delays any recovery pretty significantly and we're not expecting a V-shape by any stretch, yeah. but this would push out even our view about a recovery pace. Tony Rodriguez on some of the issues from Nuvi for the money market and for the broader economy right now. What you don't want to see is pro-cyclical fiscal impulses build, which basically just means austerity as the economy is turning down. What you want to see is counter-cyclical fiscal policy with an economy still struggling. 
that's the debate right now. It will continue. Coming up on this program, the analyst action you need to know. That'll be next in our morning calls. And later, the CEOs of tech's biggest companies testifying before Congress on Capitol Hill. James Chakman, Clockwise Capital Partner, joining us on what to expect. I imagine there's a very, very happy Saturday Nadella somewhere who will not be at these hearings. Stay tuned for complete coverage of the Tech Antitrust hearing, 12 p.m. Eastern Time. In a market right now, let's call it eight minutes away from the cash open. Equity futures up eight, positive a quarter of 1%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. tools such as income tax uh, would require a lot of time to prepare because if you don't have the base this will take time so whatever we are thinking about we think also about implementation and ease of implementation away from the opening bell, equity futures rolling over just a little bit with positive eight points for the S&P 500, up a quarter of a 1% this Wednesday morning. Good morning to you all. Let's get you some morning calls, a look at some of the analyst recommendations on Wall Street this morning. First up, JP Morgan upgrading our brands to overweight the $32 price target. The analyst signing an attractive risk reward with the company's brands well positioned for a post-COVID environment. That stock up by 23%. Your second call from Piper, upgrading Kraft Heinz to overweight with a $39 price target. The analyst expecting greater food at home trends to provide a sustainable lift into 2021. We inch higher there by eight, nine tenths of one percent. And your third and final call from Susquehanna, upgrading AMD to positive. An $85 price target. The analyst expected the company to start closing the competitive gap with Intel after some impressive quarterly results. That stock is up by a little more than 11 percent. Staying on tech, the CEOs of tech's biggest companies testifying on Capitol Hill. That's coming up shortly with James Chakman, Clockwise Capital Partners, joining us with a look at what we can expect from their testimony. Stay tuned to Bloomberg for complete coverage of the hearing at 12 p.m. Eastern Time.
isn't it just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade we did see some pressure on the yuan we did see some pressure on the futures that is now being reversed what a day coming up in washington dc in the market this is how we're priced going into the cash open equity futures up eight on the s p 500 we advance a quarter of one percent up a half of 1% on the NASDAQ. NASDAQ futures rallying into tech hearings down on Capitol Hill. Switch up the board in the bond market ahead of the Fed. Treasury yields unchanged, 0.58%. The euro stronger, euro dollar 117.54, up a third of 1%, and crude $41.32. That's your cross asset story. Let's get to the market desk and get you some movers. Here's Bloomberg's Abigail we go to the tool. Earnings movers to take a look at this morning. Starting out with the shares of GM, they are popping this after the company put up a smaller loss than expected despite a net sales miss. Plus, June, uh, May and June better than expected. The trend's better, so investors liking that. Boeing is similar story. Despite missing both top and bottom lines, the silver lining there, cash flow is better, plus they're pairing jet production as they are prepping for a big slump. As for, for General Electric, up 1.5%. They put up a worse loss than expected. They beat revenue, and CEO Larry Culp says he sees positive cash flow by 2021. Traders clearly like that. And Starbucks, one of the bigger winners on the morning, uh, they beat top and bottom line estimates despite transactions. If you can believe this, well, you can actually with the shutdown, down 52% at the end of June, but July comps are up, so the trend is going in the right direction. Turning to tech names, the big star is clearly AMD, soaring up 11%, a solid beat. The third quarter guide is better, and it seems that it, they are expected to continue to gain on Intel stall. However, lots of other uh, laggards, Seagate, missed. The memory company, the Outlook, was below the view. Uh, this as the cloud was strong, but uh, is being offset by other areas of their business. Spotify, interesting price to perfection story, missing uh, in terms of uh, the perfection piece. Their user growth meet, met estimates, but there was not a beat up 175% into today. So traders clearly wanted more. And then finally, ADP, the business outsourcing company, their fiscal year view was worse than expected. Uh, this stock now down 20% amid the pandemic year to date, John. Abigail, thank you. Abigail Doolittle down some of the price action around about two minutes into the session. The big event on Capitol Hill, more than $5 trillion in market cap testifying at noon Eastern. The Judiciary Committee's antitrust panel hearing testimony from CEOs of the four biggest tech companies. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Kelly Lines for more. Hey, Kaylee. Hey, John. Well, I can think of no better way to set up an antitrust hearing than to point out that three of the four companies under scrutiny command market valuations of more than $1 trillion. These are behemoths, John, the largest of the large cap stocks. Amazon, Alphabet, Apple, and Facebook together make up nearly a third of the NASDAQ 100 and, of course, are outperforming on the year. Most notably, Amazon, which has rallied 65% year-to-date thanks to that stay-at-home trend. It pays to command a third of U.S. online sales when everyone has to shop online at this point. But we've also seen Apple, Facebook, and Alphabet 
posting double-digit gains as well. They alone have contributed to nearly 20% of the broader equity markets rally off the March lows. And the question is whether those gains are in jeopardy. Not only do they all report results after the bell tomorrow, but of course the CEOs heading to Capitol Hill today. You have Tim Cook, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, and Sujit Pichai all in a virtual room together in this testimony as that is part of a year-long inquiry into competition in the tech industry. Of course, for Apple, the pressure point's likely going to be its app store's payment system rules and the company's own competing offerings. For Amazon, it's its role as both a dominant marketplace and a seller of products that complete with its merchants. For Facebook, of course, the key question is its acquisitions like that of Instagram. Is it buying out rivals early in order to essentially eliminate them? And then for Alphabet, of course, it's all about the dominance of Google, the number one search engine. How does it impact the advertising industry? And I would just quickly point out, John, that these companies have spent a lot of money arguing for more favorable policy. You have the likes of both Amazon and Facebook that spent nearly $17 million in 2019 on lobbying. Amazon actually the largest spender of any individual company. You also had Alphabet and Apple com combined spending another $20 million. Shelling out all that cash, John, at the end of the day, though, they may still face more regulation. That very well could be the result of this congressional inquiry, John. Kelly Lines, thank you very much. Kelly, thank you. What I think is really interesting here is the approach from the leadership going into this testimony. We've got some pre-prepared remarks from the likes of Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg. There's a common thread here. Let me go to Bezos first. Those operations need to be close to customers and we can't outsource these jobs to China, here China very specifically, or anywhere else. To fulfill our promises to customers in this country, we need American workers to get products to American customers. You'll hear this again, American, China, American customers, American consumers. Take a listen to what Mark Zuckerberg's going to say a little bit later as well. We believe in values that the American economy was built on. Many other tech companies share these values, but there's no guarantee our values will win out. For example, China, there it is again, is building its own version of the internet focused on very different ideas. Patriotism, the United States, American versus China. James Chakmack of Clockwise Capital joins us right now. James, I just wonder if this is going to resonate on Capitol Hill. A hot button issue at the moment, a bipartisan one, is the shift against big tech. The other hot button bipartisan issue down in Washington, D.C., is the shift against the Chinese Communist Party. James, do you think these big tech CEOs can leverage those things to help their own cause? Perhaps. But I think the bigger issue is that I don't even think that we should be having, you know, the an explicit antitrust conversation that we are. You know, these kind of social upheavals are par for the course when when big cycles come to an end, like the digital cycle that we that we've been seeing for the last two decades. The problem with the antitrust debate is that it underappreciates market forces and assumes that it's kind of like the old days of the Rockefeller days where infrastructure mattered. We're in a different world right now. And, and we think that any type of kind of remedies that they try to uh, instill on these companies, breakups or whatnot, are bound to have negative consequences for consumers, no matter how you slice it. Well, James, let's put the CEOs back up on the screen again. So you can see each CEO yep. that's testifying today. There is one huge omission. There's going to be a man sitting at home watching this play out quite comfortably, I imagine. His name is Satya Nadella. He won't be there, mm -hmm. James. And I'm just wondering what Microsoft learned from the 90s into the 2000s and what they can learn from Microsoft as well. Yeah, I think Microsoft was a different animal uh, because they were engaging in practices that did cause harm to both consumers and, and uh, competing businesses alike. I think the difference today is that what we're seeing from these companies are more ill-advised business practices rather than anything that's actually tangibly harmful to consumers. You know, you look at Apple, you know, having their leverage against the third-party vendors, uh, uh, or Amazon, rather, Apple doing it against developers, and then Google and Facebook really just buying up or, or copying competition. I think those kind of business practices, I think, can put, be put a stop to. But at the end of the day, if you try to break up these companies, what will happen is that the, the scale matters. And if you have less scale, you're going to have less, ultimately, consumer benefits. And I, I think that it's a different calculus that regulators need to approach this with versus the Microsoft, which was a much more tangible type of infraction. James, we're going to hear that argument again today, no doubt from Amazon, from, from Facebook, that size can be a force for good. Do you think it can mm -hmm. be then? 
I think it can be as long as proper business practices are in place. I mean, you can make the argument that these companies are too big. That's fine. But ultimately, you know, how do you determine what's too big and, and who's actually being harmed? Like, you look at a company like Tesla, like, let's, the, all the headway that they're making with self-driving cars and all the data that they're collecting, ultimately, you could argue that they're going to be the safest self-driving cars in the world and because they have all that data. Now, with that being said, are you going to go after Elon Musk and break up Tesla when you have the ultimate safest uh, consumer vehicle out there? You know, because of the data that they're able to collect because of the scale. So I think it's a, it's a fine line. And, and I think that, you know, look at the telecom industry a couple of decades ago. You know, the government came after them, tried to regulate them, but they also came in really late. And so what happened was the cellular and digital technology and internet technology took over and telecom became irre irrelevant very quickly. And regulators tend to come to the party too late as it stands. So we think that we're in one of those situations where, you know, it could be too little too late, um, where new technologies are emerging. And without the infrastructure uh, necessities that, these, uh, that you needed in the past in order to build scale, because you can start a company from anywhere at any time, and reach any customer in the entire world. We think it's a different calculus versus what what the antitrust uh, regulators had to face in, in prior um, incidents. So James, this is the issue. For media and for people sitting at home, this is a spectacle. Some of the wealthiest, most mm -hmm. influential, smartest people on the planet, running the biggest companies on the planet, facing a grilling from Washington DC. For Wall Street, I'm looking for signs of a coherent strategy that may end up transforming these business models. But what I think we'll see is a really splintered approach between Democrats and Republicans on a whole range of issues. James, if the latter is the outcome, there's no threat to the business model, is there? No, well, it, it depends because, you know, we think that privacy is a serious issue and, and how these companies use data and how, because uh, you give up a lot of information for these companies to be able to provide the information that you have. How, uh, how critical or how loud will data portability be? How long will you, between platforms, how long can you keep that data? Can consumers potentially get remunerated for that data? You know, things like this, I think around privacy are really important. And then obviously more recently, there's the censorship layer on top um, of that. So I think data should be more uh, front and center and privacy of the conversation versus are these two companies too big and taking a more moral stance uh, versus a more legal one. Hey, James, great to catch up. Big issue. Big hearings taking place later. James Chakmak there. Stay tuned to Bloomberg. Complete coverage coming up a little bit later of those hearings, 12 Eastern. In this market right now, 10 minutes into the session, equities firmer by four-tenths of 1%. The Nasdaq outperforms at the market desk. Here's Abigail. Well, John, let's take a look at a number of movers here this morning that have one thing in common, and that is a, a high short interest. So perhaps these stocks are trading higher on a short squeeze. This may be the least the case with Occidental, up 1.3%, a 5% short interest there. On a Bloomberg exclusive, uh, the company is discussing selling $4.5 billion worth of assets in Africa and the Middle East. The stock, again, is higher. Now, as for the real short squeeze, take a look at L Brands, 9% short interest there. They did a report. They announced, four, or excuse me, they announced yesterday $400 million in annual cost cuts, mainly at Victoria's Secret. Uh, apparently Bath & Body Works, though, is really on fire. J.P. Morgan has raised their rating to overweight from neutral, saying it's the best comp story out there. Another big short squeeze, FireEye. They put up a big beat, but there's a 9% short interest there as well. Uh, the stay-at-home trend really uh, helping them. Wall Street likes the story. The price targets have been raised across the street. And then finally, the biggest short interest of them all, perhaps not the biggest short squeeze, though, Avis, a 30% bearish short interest. The short's getting squeezed out this morning, popping as the revenues for this company, 10% better than expected. The smaller loss was reported as well. And it seems, John, that during this pandemic, that travel, folks are really taking to the roads. Abigail, thank you. 11, 12 minutes into the session. Equities on the front foot in the United States. The S&P 500 are by four-tenths of 1% lagging. Europe on the divide coming up next Samantha Azzarello JP Morgan asset management global market strategist from New York City this morning good morning you're watching Bloomberg TV
the Boston Symphony Orchestra presents BSO at Home. While you stay inside, enjoy a curated collection of archived concerts and behind-the-scenes stories from BSO musicians. BSO Homeschool provides lessons for music lovers of all ages. New performances and messages from musicians are added regularly. Enjoy these selections and much more at bso.org slash at home. Fifteen minutes into the session, equities advance a half of one percent on the S&P, up seven tenths on the Nasdaq, and the market desk with the sector price action. Here's Abigail. Um, we're looking at a mildly risk-on uh, tone this morning relative to sectors. If we use the uh, terminal, the IMAP and the Bloomberg terminal, we will see most sectors are higher. So that clearly is a bullish uh, factor as investors go towards stocks. Only two sectors down, down slightly up top, a bit of a cyclical tilt and a stay-at-home tilt. Real estate and industrials are among the uh, big uh, sectors higher, plus tech and consumer discretionary. Financials near the bottom. That's also the story on the year, John. If we take a look at the financial sector on the year, it's amazing just how beaten up this sector is. Of course, with yields, uh, we have the financial sector down 22% on the year, year as the 10-year yield gives up a seemingly amazing 1.3%. The KBW Bank Index down 35%, John, its worst year since 2008. So the financial sector still in a world of hurt this year. Abigail Zilitzel, thank you very much. Looking at this equity market at the moment, the S&P 500 advancing by around about a half of 1%. The Nasdaq up by three quarters of a 1%. I believe we have Guy Johnson with us on some of the bank earnings as well. Good morning to you, Guy. We see more of the same that we saw in the United States as well. Uh, absolutely. There are some nuances that are worth dealing with, though, John. Barclays, clearly a bank that is under pressure today. Most of the banks that are reported, their stocks here in Europe are down kind of circa 5%. Let's start off with Barclays. Uh, Just Staley's trading division doing very well for him, but he's kind of counterbalanced that with a big provision uh, against future uh, debts and um, uh, non-performing loans uh, coming through. Uh, and I think basically he's painting a pretty negative picture for the UK economy. Also negative for the UK economy today is Santander taking a huge goodwill right down against this UK business, John, circa uh, 6 billion euros. And that's again painting a very negative picture for the UK economy. But basically all of the banks today particularly those ones with trading arms, have suggested that we are likely to see the performance that has been coming through from those trading arms fading as we work our way throughout the rest of the year. That was the message we got from Jess Staley today over at Barclays. It was the message we got from James von Molke over at Deutsche Bank in Germany as well. Uh, basically, at the moment, these di divisions are doing quite well, but you cannot rely on them going forward, John. Looking forward to the coverage guy at the top of the hour with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. We can continue the conversation now with Samantha Azzarello of JP Morgan Asset Management saying she sees opportunity in international markets. Send the following. Europe has been a performance laggard, but has an added benefit of being undervalued and exposure to cyclical sectors. Samantha joins us now on the phone. Sam, walk me through that. This big push that's become almost consensus over the last several weeks, Europe over the United States. Well, I think it has to do with the macro picture, first and foremost. So we can get into valuations, we can get into, you know, compositions of the market, right, because Europe has a lot more exposure to cyclicality, which we probably want as we're starting to recover. But I would say, first and foremost, Europe has crushed their COVID curves. Right, and the U.S. has not. So we see that in the data, right, whether we're looking at Google mobility data or even just PMI data, a lot more improvement happening in Europe. So PMI services, even from June to July for the euro area, it went from 48 to 55. So back into expansion here, and that's not the picture in the U.S. So I would say this tilt to Europe, this refocus on Europe, it's a little bit about relative weakness in the U.S., at least in our minds. Sam, what's the difference between a value trap and a value gap when we talk about Europe and the United States? Because for many people who have allocated to Europe, particularly in the previous cycle, it was a trap and not a gap that closed. Why is it different this time? So that's a very good question, a very important distinction, and it, it might not be in terms of valuations as to why we want to refocus on Europe, just to be completely honest, right? Because we've looked at that gap for a long time. I'm with you, many investors, and yet it hasn't worked out. So maybe in some sense it's been justified, right, the fact that the European market trades at a lower PE. 
I think relative aside, maybe we want to relook at Europe even just from a standpoint of being more balanced in the portfolio. Um, and I would just add that Europe is going to get base effects in terms of second quarter, their growth is a lot lower because they did stricter lockdowns. So now base effect wise, we're getting a bigger surge in growth in Europe. That's going to support the equity market there. I mean, that will, and they've had a lower unemployment rate, but I think that's a really good question, Jonathan. And I don't think it's clear yet whether that value gap was justified or not between the U.S. and Europe. It might not be. Would love your thoughts on the financials as well. Typically coming out of the bottom, out of any kind of downturn, you'd see the cyclical areas of the market perform. You'd see banks participate in that. This is something City has picked up on. They call it pandemic decouplings. Why do you think bank stocks haven't participated in quite the same way this time around? I think there's broad market narratives that, frankly, they provide framing for investors. So with interest rates being so low, it's really hard to get out of the, the framing trap that financials can do well. Right? We know low interest rates not good for financials across the board, but that's not the whole story. If you go a little bit deeper, right, we're looking at amazing trading revenue, obviously for some of the big integrated diversified banks, but also asset and wealth management. I mean, that's been healthy and robust for a lot of global banks, and that's been a support right, for earnings. And I think going forward, right? I don't want to be investing just through the end of 2020 because too much right. is shifting, too much is changing right now. So secular trends, higher savings rate, all right, especially among those with higher income in the higher income bracket, that in our mind means more demand for asset and wealth management products. So I would want to be tilted to financials in that space, maybe not regional banks. Secular trends for many people just sounds like a posh way of saying software stocks, Sam. Why is it more than that? <laughs> Well, I'd hope it's more than that because it's the future, right? So we want to obviously be tethered to how things are changing in the future. Um, I mean, you have seen software and software as a service do much better than hardware names. So, you know, even within tech, you go below the surface and there's things happening. And I think sometimes we just scream from the rooftops that technology stocks are amazing. So I think, you know, as we go forward and we're watching these changes, we're trying to keep a pulse on them. It does mean we have to be more selective in every single sector, full stop. Samantha Azzarello there of J.P. Morgan Asset Management on the latest. Got to head down to Washington and hear from the President of the United States alongside the Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin. I believe we can hear the President's comments that took place just moments ago on the fiscal front. The negotiations ongoing down in Washington, D.C. We have a bill from the Republicans. The President has called it almost semi-irrelevant at this point. We have a bill from the Democrats that passed months ago. Let's take a listen to what the President has to say. Alongside Secretary Mnuchin, I apologize for the audio issues with that particular recording. Up next on the program, we'll run you through the trading diary, what you need to be watching in the day ahead. From New York City this morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg. we took you inside the political turmoil gripping Hong Kong. This year, Beijing tightened its position with a new national security law. Will this jeopardize Hong Kong's position as a global financial center? And will China face the consequences from abroad? I'm Stephen Engel. We take a second look at the crisis facing the city in a Bloomberg television special, Hong Kong on Edge 2.
Weston. Bloomberg Television is reinventing one of the most iconic brands in financial television for a new audience. Join me to see the news program for the clever investor. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. Today coming up in Washington, D.C., a Federal Reserve decision coming a little bit later, tech hearings as well, and the fiscal talks ongoing. Let's head down to Washington and catch up with Kevin Cerulli, our Bloomberg chief Washington correspondent. Kevin, we heard from the president moments ago. My apologies for the audio problems we had on this end. What have we heard from the president as he gets set to leave Washington on a big day for politicians? Precisely. In fact, Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin also addressing reporters, and he says that House Democrats and Republicans remain, quote unquote, world apart in terms of where they are for the negotiations. So he says that there's still a lot of work to be done on the negotiations. As of now, we are far apart, Secretary Mnuchin telling uh, reporters there. And as you mentioned, now President Trump heads to Texas, where he is set to meet with donors and also deliver remarks on the energy proposals that he's putting out for his policies. An interesting moment to head to Texas and get out of Washington. <laughs> Kevin, great to catch up with you, sir. Busy day ahead, as always. I say it every day, Kevin. Great to catch up with you, sir. 26 minutes into the session, here's your equity market. Up a half of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we advance by three quarters of 1%. What a day for Washington. The focus and coverage continues right here on Bloomberg TV. From New York City this morning, good morning. This was the countdown to the open. Catch me on Twitter at Ferro TV. This is Bloomberg. opportunity knocks at the door don't say blimey I've still got my pajamas on to say yes to stuff and it will take you into some places we're clearly going through some very unusual uh, times uh, and you know e enormous uh, difficulties uh, getting groups of people to agree on things from Bloomberg's European headquarters in the city of London join us on leaders with LACWA essential market data flowing seamlessly. We keep on so you can keep on. The national security bill was passed by Chinese lawmakers. The Hong Kong police force has already acted in accordance with the new law. It's a very disturbing development. This is, uh, in effect, 
an attempt to end one country, two systems. The central government is telling us just stay out of politics. Months after Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico is still in peril. Huge swaths of the island are still without power, running water, or access to medical care. Experts estimate that it will take years before these services are restored island-wide. Much of the blame has been placed on FEMA for a slow response in comparison to recent disasters on the mainland. But recovery from a disaster of this complexity and scale has proven more challenging than anyone anticipated. And filling the gaps between an overextended public sector and a suffering populace falls on the private citizens. Robert Anderson is a Puerto Rico resident of four years. The eye of the storm came in south of El Yunque, swept up towards San Juan and out to Arecibo. Everything on the right-hand side is what we call the dirty side of the storm. This isn't his first time in a disaster zone. With a military and telecom background, Anderson worked on repairing damaged cell phone towers in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Some might be tempted to label him a disaster capitalist, seeking lucrative government contracts for his expertise. But as Anderson finds himself in the middle of a humanitarian crisis, he and his associates are developing a variety of pro bono recovery projects that target the island's hardest hit areas. I see two Puerto Ricos. We're here in San Juan, they have telecommunications restored, it may or may not have power, but basic services are in place. They're able to get food. They're able to buy things. They're surviving. And when you look outside of the San Juan area, you can go 15 minutes from here and find areas that are devastated. I'm working on the devastated side. Today, he's put together a boots-on-the-ground mission to provide medical care to some of the island's most isolated and vulnerable residents. Steve Berenbaum is one of Anderson's business associates. He offered an extra car and a set of hands. So we received an initial report from a nurse that was out in the area. We're headed to the northeast region of Utuado for some people that are in need of urgent medical assistance. Dr. Sally Priester is a physician from San Juan. She filled a van with medical supplies at her own expense and brought along a team of nurses. Google Maps estimated our first destination to be a 90-minute drive but it didn't account for obstacles like this. Our first stop was the home of an 82-year-old blind Vietnam veteran. His roof was blown off by the storm, and he's been living alone in a back shed for nearly two months. His cane actually got broken in the storm, um, so he's limited mobility. He has a number of medical ailments. Dr. Priester's having a look at him. We called the VA. They're going to get him set up with what he needs, get him stabilized so he can then be transported either to an evacuation center or off the island. It's when the chain gets broken, when those, when those families that are connected to them leave the island or take off. These guys get left at the end of the road, and um, it's tough. FEMA was not officially part of Robert's team, and their arrival caught everyone by surprise. Their job here was to survey and report back to their superiors and did not come with medical aid of any kind. People think that FEMA is there to hand out bottles of water. It's not what they do. FEMA has a role to play. They have a very specific role. They bring in ships. They bring in airplanes. They bring in tractor trailers with pallets of things. But they're a big machine, um, and there's gaps in that thing. And you're seeing one of the gaps here, and we help fill that role. These guys are in a bad situation before, and now they're struggling for real basic things. One of the risks that you run is people going from fear to hopelessness. Uh, those are the folks that we're trying to reach. And how are they reached? How are they even found? Word of mouth, mostly. And what's your role in all this? Um, ghost in the machine. I'm lucky enough to be able to communicate with folks in FEMA, the uh, state of Puerto Rico. For a ghost, Robert makes his presence well known. Not only was he the de facto leader of the mission, now with FEMA in tow, he created his own maps to survey storm damage. So we're uh, right here. 
and delivered them to FEMA HQ free of charge. I have pretty good reach. Perhaps that's how he managed to earn himself a coveted FEMA badge without actually working for them. And it's these relationships that allow him to operate more efficiently than an NGO or a government agency. We're able to resolve problems at a different level. Our next stop was on a mountaintop, a family of 11 struggling to care for their special needs brother in what was left of their house. Probably we are the first uh, health team uh, to come and visit this family. Muy bien, todo muy bien. The patient has a uh, Down syndrome, he's all day in bed. The difficulty with this is the patient cannot be alone. The most important thing is that you need to take care of the chronic disease beside his ability because they have been not going to a doctor. No doctor has come in here yet. So we need a refill of this medication. After maybe 54 days, it's not getting better. And the only way that you can be able to see that is to come in to the ground, drive, and see the people and talk to the people. You can see San Juan from here, but you can't get there. It's like the Emerald City. On this stop, we caught word that a man living alone at the edge of the jungle was in need of care. So we decided to take a little detour, come up here and check out and see what's going on. One of the challenges is to find those people that are at the end of these roads that need help. Pero porque estás solo? Porque estás por acá tan solo? I'm asking about uh, why he's alone right here. He said things of life happens, you know, I'm here, so, so where do you live here? This is not a job. To do this, you need to have passion for what you can do. You're not going to get paid. It said in disaster response and emergency response that the real first responders are your neighbors. You don't need to wait for a lucrative FEMA contract to go out and, and do good and to help the community. In the end, do you feel like you're making a difference? The lives you touch and people that you can affect, I don't really think about it in those terms. But why do you do it? It, it helps me sleep at night. Um, I think it's as much for the people that are going out to help and do things as it is for the people that you affect. Whether out of altruism, or the lure of a paid gig, or some mixture of the two, Anderson hopes to stay here to help shape Puerto Rico's future. Puerto Rico's essentially been a colony for 400 years. It was treated poorly by the Spanish. It was not treated well by the United States when they first got here. Puerto Rico can continue in the way that it's always been, or Puerto Rico can rebuild itself like nothing that's ever been. And we have to do everything we can to make that real. That's the bottom line.